afternoon and welcome to the uh, June 2020 meeting of the Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees. Uh, this is a somewhat unique meeting as the last several have been as we are meeting both in person with uh, six of the seven trustees and cabinet uh, around the room. We are socially distanced. Um, we all wear masks when we're not at our table so that we're at least six feet apart. Um, and one of the things that was mentioned to me, everybody that's in this room, if we wanna hear each other in this room, we will need to speak up louder maybe than a normal voice. Zoom will pick it up fine. These microphones are tuned to Zoom. Uh, they're not tuned to give us more uh, volume in this room. And since we're uh, a number of feet away, uh, we'll need to practice that. I wanna start um, with our Pledge of Allegiance as we always do, if you'd help, help me uh, honor our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The next item I want to make sure we do is thank those who took the time, extra time and effort, of, along with every other job they do and have been doing since mid-March. Um, our IS department and our AV department. Um, I've got Adrian, Jason, Ann, Scott, Sam, Ron, and Derek. Um, thank you all very much. This was not a simple effort. Um, I come in here and it's all set up. You make it look easy. We have equipment. We have cords. We have duct tape on the floor. We have microphones. So thank you very much. All you do for the college. Um, we do have a quorum. I see Trustee Lawson on the screen. Can you wave, please? We've got, you're in a little screen up on our monitor, so can you wave to make sure that... Trustee Lawson, can you just... You, I can't even hear you guys. Are you guys. Is your microphones on? Is someone, whoever's setting up the Zoom, can they move the laptop closer to you guys? Because... We'll, we'll check. The microphones are supposed to be individually connected to the Zoom. Can you hear any of that? I can barely hear you. We're checking on the volume for the microphones for you who are on Zoom. I, I can hear you um, loud and clear on my connection here. Not sure about others on the call. I could hear Tom clear, but anybody hey. in that room, I can't hear. Can we, does my mic work any better? Dr. Sopcich, do you want to say something? See about your mic. Can you hear this, Doc? Um, can you hear this, Trustee Lawson? Uh, a little bit better. I think you your voice projects better. Even if you get it this close, does that make any better? That's way better. So I guess the message is you've got to get about an inch or two away from <laughs> the the microphone. There you go. All right, Trustee Lawson, how does this work? Uh, wow. Hi. I don't know if that's me or the magic man with the uh, board over there, but I will try to stay close to the microphone. Um, if, if at some point you can't hear, please, please uh, interject. We can't see a, a chat message or anything because we don't have your monitor in front of each of us. But let us know if you can't hear. Okay. The signal is going in and out. You're getting choppy. So I just wanted to let you guys know because someone's watching that. Who else is on Zoom? Jason, are you on Zoom? I am. Are you having any trouble hearing? You're sounding much better now than you were previously. Okay. Derek, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Well, one thing I mentioned to the numerous staff who have worked extra to set this up is that um, I think unless this meeting is extremely and unusually productive, I think we will go back to either a Zoom meeting completely or to have a few trustees in the boardroom, which is already wired for this, and then a few trustees participate by Zoom, as I know other governing bodies have done, because this is really above and beyond the call for our staff, and I don't want to do that on a monthly basis. Uh, we do have a quorum. We have all seven trustees here. 
six trustees in the room and Trustee Lawson participating by Zoom. Um, the first item on our agenda, as always, is our open forum. The open forum is an opportunity for members of the public to comment on items, uh, provide comments to the board. There will be one open forum provided at each, each of the college's regularly scheduled board meetings. Comments are limited to five minutes unless a large number of speakers intend to participate, in which case the chair uh, may limit a person's comments to less than five minutes. Tonight we have eight people uh, signed up, so I will ask people to limit their comments to three minutes. In order to be recognized, individuals must, must register. The registration for Zoom meetings is on the college's website, along with the board's agenda. Um, and registration is closed at 5 p.m. the night before in order to allow our staff, again, to give speaker privileges to those who have registered for the open comment section. When addressing the board, registered speakers are asked to remain at the podium, which I guess remain at your computer, um, should be respectful and are encouraged to address individual personnel or student matters directly with the appropriate college department. As a practice, the college does not respond in this setting when the matter concerns personnel or student issues or matters that are being addressed through our established grievance processes or are otherwise the subject of review by the college or board. With that, our first speaker today registered is Angelina Lawson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, tonight, as a citizen, I hope to have a voice to speak. I want to remind this board of a longstanding policy that we do not interact with the public section. I want to talk about Black Lives Matter and our police academy on campus. I've had a good discussion with Ken uh, Sizam, also the mayor of Miriam, a former police chief who also was not okay with the actions of those police officers in the murder of George Floyd. We talked about opportunities for more oversight with the legislature and possibly uh, with the board of trustees when it comes to having an accredited curriculum. I was informed that nobody is trained on rubber bullets, no charcoal, uh, no tear gas. The recruits are tasered and pepper sprayed, and that is done so that they understand how that impacts someone else. We need to have more citizen review boards for every police department and more oversight in our policies. We need to actively get to know our police officers. When I hear blue lives matter, nobody is born blue. A job does not give you the right to murder. George Floyd was murdered by several officers officers who all had their knee on his body, suffocating him while he had handcuffs on and calling out, I cannot breathe, mama. And those officers did not even get up after he was suffocated to death, even after he was pronounced dead, even after the ambulance came with no EMTs inside, but more officers. And only then did they get up off his lifeless body, but only when cued with the several taps from another officer that came to remove George Floyd's body. All of this happened in front of their peers. This is why there is outrage. Our police officers are not judges and juries on the street where a minor offense are the death penalty. Black Lives Matter educates and white people need to listen and interrupt racist comments in the grocery stores when only white people are around. This is why we see this, the, the idea of white silence becomes endorsement of violence. You can interrupt racist comments. I don't agree with that or say, please stop. At the college, we do not stand for racism or discrimination. This month is also Pride Month for LGBTQ community. We hear about intersection with different groups merging together. In the last week, two young black transgender women were murdered. Standards that diminish the value of life harm all of us. When someone says Black Lives Matter, they are reminding you that too often our society values life differently and makes their lives less. All communities need to know that we value them. And I just wanted this statement to be set on record. Thank you. The next registered speaker is Adija Suleiman. I apologize if I very much butchered your name pronunciation. Are you there, Ms. Suleiman? I am not seeing him in the attendee list. Okay, we'll, we will come back to that at the end of the other speakers. The next registered speaker is Christy Welder. Christy Welder. And it does take a minute of those in the room for our technology folks to hook up the Zoom connection and promote them to speaker.
Good afternoon, can you hear me? Thank you for your time. My name is Christy Welder. I grew up in Olathe and I live in Shawnee. I'm a wife, mom of three young children and a lawyer. And I'm here today to talk about changes to the Title IX regulations. For all remaining speakers, please give your name and address at the start of your remarks. Sure, uh, Christy Welder, uh, Shawnee, Kansas. Thank you for your time. My name is Christy Welder. I grew up in Olathe and live in Shawnee. I'm a wife, mom of three young children, and a lawyer. I'm here today to talk about the changes to Title IX regulations that protect victims of sexual assault that could have tragic consequences. Right now, there are laws requiring this school to provide wheelchair ramps throughout, throughout campus. But imagine if those laws were suddenly repealed. The school wouldn't have to have wheelchair ramps and if the administration only changed their policies to conform to the changes in the law, no wheelchair ramps would exist anywhere on campus. What would this board do? Hopefully, you would continue to provide ramps even though you didn't have to because you have a responsibility to your students that goes far beyond just complying with the law. The same thing is now occurring with Title IX. The Trump administration has set forth new regulations that will take effect this August which weaken protections for Thank students. Thank you for your patience, Christy. Can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, Christy, we cannot hear you in the room. Ah. Uh although they can hear you at the speaker board. And now yes. um, I'm able to hear her. In the room. Please be patient. Of course. I can hear you, yes. yes. Okay. That might be just me to do it. Christy, uh, I apologize for the technology. We are going to hold yourself or the cell phone where we can hear you next to the microphone so that folks in this room can hear you. Uh, would you please give your name and address, and then I will start the clock on your three minutes. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Christy Welder. Uh, I'm in Shawnee, Kansas. Thank you for your time. I grew up in Olathe. I live in Kansas. I'm a wife, mother of three young children, and a lawyer. And I'm here today to talk about changes to the Title IX regulations protecting victims of sexual assault that could have tragic consequences. Right now, there are laws requiring this school to provide wheelchair ramps throughout campus. But imagine if those laws were suddenly repealed the school wouldn't have to have wheelchair ramps. And if the administration only changed their policies to conform to the change in law, no wheelchair ramps would exist anywhere on campus. What would this board do? Hopefully, you would continue to provide ramps even though you didn't have to, because you have a responsibility to your students that goes far beyond just complying with the law. The same thing is now occurring with Title IX. The Trump administration has set forth new regulations that will take effect this August, which weaken protections for students who are the victims of sexual assault and violence and create new hurdles to reporting sexual assault and holding perpetrators accountable. One of the huge changes is actually to redefine the term sexual harassment to exclude a lot of terrible conduct from being investigated by the school. The effect will be to silence and intimidate victims. If this school chooses not to act, and to be clear, a failure to take action is a conscious choice. It is failing its students. Just as in the wheelchair ramp analogy, you have a responsibility to your students that goes far beyond just basic complying with the law. 
The good news is that Title IX provides just a minimum, not a maximum, of the protections you can provide your students. Many institutions are creating their own set of policies now to give back those rights to students that these new regulations are taking away. For instance, continuing to make teachers and administrators mandatory reporters of sexual assault, continuing to investigate off-campus reports of assault, providing post-assault services, and taking strong preventative actions to prevent assault. What the, the school should not do is nothing. I understand that human resources managers are working to comply with the new regulations. But compliance should be the beginning, not the ending, the floor, not the ceiling. The school risks deeply re-traumatizing victims of sexual violence, as well as igniting a media and legal firestorm if the school's decisions fail to protect their students. Instead, the school should work with other institutions, student groups, women's rights groups, and sexual assault experts to continue providing a safe learning environment in the wake of these large changes. You have an opportunity to stand up. I hope you will take this opportunity to be allies in the fight against sexual violence, not adversaries. Thank you for your Thank you, Christy. Again, apologies for the technology. I'm certainly not aware of any endeavor by this college to change our, our protections for uh, anybody discriminated based on sex or other issues or victims of sexual assault, uh, whether the administration rules go into effect or not and certainly as the uh, mr. father chair of mr chair i think we just need to hold our comments because there is a an issue in the hr that does discuss this so i just want to make sure that that's stated as your opinion uh, it is stated as my opinion trustee lawson as each of us when we speak we're speaking our own opinion as the father of an advocate at uh metropolitan organization to, to counter sexual assault i certainly agree with the statements uh, made by uh, miss welder the next uh, speaker represented here is Colleen Cunningham. Ms. Cunningham, would you state your name and address? Hi, I'm Colleen Cunningham and I live in Overland Park, Kansas. Can everybody hear me? Please proceed. Okay, we we can you. hear you as best we can. If you speak up, it will be better. Okay, thank you. Um, tonight I want to speak briefly about the important role that Johnson County Community College plays in this current political moment and ask school leadership to ensure that your work leads and reflects our community's best potential. Watching the Black Lives Matter rallies across the country and participating in them locally, I've been struck by the passion, leadership, and activism of young people. And I'm reminded of Colleen. Yeah. Colleen, this is this is a chair. I don't want to interrupt, but, but I will give you more time if you will speak up and speak more slowly so that we can hear you in the room. Okay, I would be glad to do that. Thank you. Sure. Um, watching the Black Lives Matter rallies across the country and participating in them locally, I've been struck by the passion, leadership, and activism of young people. And I'm reminded of the historical context for this. Young people have always played an outsized and leading role in working to bring greater equity and inclusion to institutions, from school desegregation efforts in the civil rights era to more recent protests against overcrowded, underfunded K-12 schools and for protections for undocumented youth. In their fight to bring justice to the people whose names we can now all learn, such as George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, as well as to bring attention to more general issues of justice and inequity, young people are using their voices. In celebrating Pride Month, we remember its roots at the Stonewall Inn in 1969, the same year that Johnson County Community College was established. Even prior to the Stonewall riots, there was an LGBTQ student movement growing in institutions of higher education. The voices of these young people served as a catalyst for the modern LGBTQ plus rights movement. And it's only through the continuing work of these community members and their allies that we see victories, such as this week's Supreme Court decision providing protection for LGBTQ employees. Similarly, the experiences and testimonies that made way for the passage of Title IX in 1972. While commonly thought of as the law that mandates equity in school sports, Title IX provides protection for access to higher education, protections for pregnant and parenting students, and in fighting sexual harassment. 
When schools fail to live up to that charge, it is the courageous voices of students that push for better and safer learning environments for everyone. Perhaps owing to the proximity to these outspoken young people, schools and particularly institutions of higher education have historically played an important role in all of these movements towards justice. Schools cannot be mere observers of these changes and they have often taken decisive stands. Some examples include schools closing rather than desegregating following the Brown versus Board of Education decision, schools staying open for a single student, such as in the case of Ruby Bridges, and more recently, universities deciding to sever or not sever ties with the US Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, and so on. As trustees and leaders at Johnson County Community College, you have an immense amount of power in this moment. As community leaders, you have the opportunity to use your platforms to proclaim support for black students and other students of color, LGBTQ plus students, students whose comfort and safety are impacted by title protections, as well as faculty and staff members who are members of our community and these protected groups. I wanna thank Trustee Smith Everett for using her platform to make such a statement and for pointing out that when JCCC was established, the vision of who would make up this educational community does not match the realities of today. We have to ask ourselves, how can we ensure that our college is fully supporting all students, faculty and staff when it was not built with such diversity in mind? We have to ask other difficult questions. Do budgets reflect our community's priorities and values? Do anti-discrimination policies need to be strengthened? Does the college fully support diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives? Our students, faculty, and staff provided a welcoming outlet for reporting concerns where they can be confident that their concerns will be adequately addressed. How do we live up to the new standards that young people are setting? Your decisions here and now will ripple through the community for years to come. Will you rise to the challenge of this moment and encourage others in your community to do the same? Will you use your voices to support the work of these amazing young people in our community and welcome change to our college? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask if all of the speakers have their comments in writing, if they would submit them to the college and uh, we can get an email address for you. We will include them in full with the audio transcript of this presentation because the video audio is not very good right now. So uh, for the speakers that have spoken so far, if you want to submit your comments, I will announce an email here shortly where you can email your written comments and we'll include them um, in, in, the, in their entirety, uh, either with the transcript on the website or with the minutes when the minutes are uh, ultimately approved. Thank you, Colleen. The next speaker listed is Val Ball. Do, do you, Jason, would you like a few moments to see if we can do something better than this or are we at, as good as we're gonna get? Valerie's not in the attendee list. Ms. Ball, B-A-U-L, is not on the attendance list? I'm here. Okay. Are you under a different name, Ms. Ball? I don't know what link I'm supposed to use. What name does it say at the bottom of your screen? Um, I, I got a link from... Uh, trustee lawson because i was not emailed the link okay um why don't we take a few minutes to get to the fix um so we can hear all the remaining speakers we have one two three four plus uh miss suleiman if if uh they appear so well, we're gonna suspend the open comment session so we can hopefully hear the comments themselves um, and move to the uh, college reports. We'll start first with the college lobbyist, uh, Mr. Carter, are you available? Can you hear me okay? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Well, I want to work. So please go ahead, Mr. Carter. Thank you. 
I'll provide just a brief recap of some of the things that have been happening uh, over the past month and a half. Uh, and, and I really want to focus my comments on uh, a meeting that occurred this week uh, at the Board of Regents. Uh, the sine die session occurred on May 21. It was a full 24 hours. Nine bills were sent to the governor with multiple topics covered in each one of those bills. Four bills were vetoed. Uh, the COVID emergency order bill, the higher education bill, which contained college promise and free ACT testing, the uh, overall uh, or the all encompassing tax bill and a banking bill were all vetoed by the governor. The governor called a special session on June 3rd. The legislature returned to work on COVID liability and emergency orders and what that process should look like when the legislature is not in session. Uh, that bill passed uh, at the end of uh, the special session, which went through about 5 p.m. on June 4th. And then that, that concludes the special session. Um, should there be another special session called later on, uh, we'll have to deal with, with whatever those topics or issues are as, uh, as they're brought up. The Legislative Budget Committee uh, and the State Finance Council have met this week both to address different uh, components of COVID emergency funding. But what I would like to focus on the most this evening is something called the Future of the Higher Education Committee. This is not a legislatively requested committee. Uh, there was discussion in a budget committee during the regular portion of the session where legislators were asking Blake Flanders, president and CEO of the Kansas Board of Regents for a three-year, five-year, and a 10-year plan for higher education. So let me, let me reiterate, this is not a legislatively mandated or requested committee. Uh, Mr. Flanders uh, convened a committee uh, and that committee will make recommendations to the Kansas legislature. Uh, Nancy Ingram from our Board of Trustees is serving as the KACCT representative on this group. There are legislators on the committee. On Tuesday, uh, most of the day was spent discussing a lengthy background on the higher education system in Kansas. Uh, we should be very concerned and, and my concerns were raised by a number of topics that were discussed uh, and, and even just some, some responses um, by the, the Board of Regents CEO. Um, KBOR staff presented on ad valorem dollars, uh, which are locally generated and locally decided by the elected trustees. Um, board staff discussed the legacy computer systems that exist at the 19 different community colleges and the inability to uh, communicate back and forth with regard to uh, data sets. Um, legislators asked questions about service areas and there was conversation about cost models. Uh, probably what was concerning the most to me, and I think this sort of indicates the direction things could go, uh, was when uh, asked a question, uh, Dr. Flanders responded that if there is a local need to fill a solution, we should probably allow the community colleges to offer that program. Uh, so, so that's a very bold statement coming from a coordinating board um, when we have uh, boards of trustees who are elected to represent each individual institution. I would think there will be at least two more meetings uh, and, a, and a report will be generated. The next meeting of this group uh, will be on July 16th of uh, 2020. And uh, certainly I would invite uh, Trustee Ingram to, to follow up with any comments if, if I missed anything of importance uh, as a result of the other, uh, uh, the comments that I made about the meeting the other day. And then finally, um, I just wanna uh, make a comment that we don't know what it looks like yet, but we uh, anticipate that there will be allotments coming from uh, the administration. And we're hearing to the tune of about $700 million. Um, that is a large pot of money that is nearly equal to the entire amount uh, of state general fund dollars that are given to higher education. Please understand, I'm using that as a comparison. Those dollars are not going to all come from the higher education uh, budgets, but 
it's very concerning that uh, that that budget picture looms before uh, the legislature likely returns in January of next year. So, Mr. Chairman, I would stop there. That kind of gives a, a very up-to-the-date snapshot of, of what is happening. We will have interim committees uh, that, that will likely meet later on in the fall. This is an election year for all House members and all Senate members, and so they are campaigning in earnest uh, throughout the, the summer and, excuse me, fall months. Thank you. Trustee Ingram, did you want to add anything now about um, the higher education I was, I was prepared to do that when I give the KACCT report, but I can sure do it now while he is with us. I don't know if he's planning to continue. The, it, and I appreciate your comments completely, Dick. So thank you very much. Um, ex, there, was concern, there was concern expressed to me um, prior to the meeting, after the meeting. So I've been in discussions with uh, our executive director, Heather Morgan, uh, in addition to sitting through that meeting. What I wanna do is share the names of the people who are on the committee, Dick. Um, it's Cheryl Harrison Lee, who is chairing it. Molly Bumgardner is on it. Terry Beck, Ed Berger, Blake Flanders, Tom Hawk, Steve Hubert, myself, Cynthia Lane, Jim Lewis, who is the other trustee, he is from Dodge City Community or Dodge County Community College, Dodge City Community College, excuse me. Ken Rajas, Ken Romer, and Brandon Woodard, who is Woodard, who is also another local uh, legislator. So I, I agree with his concern. Uh, the charge to us was twofold. It's to analyze existing affiliations and partnerships in the KBOR system to enhance the delivery of higher education to Kansans and to ensure the alignment of facility and infrastructure capacity with projected enrollments. Now, initially I was told that it was to construct a three, five and 10 year plan, uh, but we did not hear anything about moving forward with that. So you are correct. Our next meeting is July the 16th and I will leave it at that. Thank you, Trustee Ingram. Um, Mr. Carter, I've always been amused by the term allotments because it appears as though we're going to be getting more money and the Topeka is going to allot us money, but they're going to allot us costs. Is that right? Or cuts? Yeah, allotments in this sense mean cuts. 700 million out of an operating, uh, base operating budget of how much? Uh, seven, six or seven billion dollars for the state of Kansas. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Cross. It could be, thank you, Mr. Chair. It could be my intellectual limitation, but I, I don't quite understand. Sure, I, I don't quite understand what we're talking about, that the state is gonna hand the community college system allotments, essentially orders to make cuts. Okay, okay. I, what I heard uh, was that the, the legislature is going, or that the administration is going to uh, make cuts to community colleges it would be out of the dollars that we receive via the block grant, which are state general fund dollars. So we have to give back money or we're going to be cut? Depending on when those dollars are dispersed, it can be both. Um, we are at the beginning of the fiscal year. And I would imagine I may, I may need to refer to Dr. Weber or Rachel uh, Lears. Uh, I don't know if that first payment has been cut uh, from the state. I don't, I'm not sure when we receive that, that uh, installment. I think we receive dollars twice a year from, from the state of Kansas or from the legislature. And then whose idea is this? Does this come from the governor or is this somebody on the council or who? who? Yeah, the allotments will come from the administration. And so that would be the governor's, the governor's recommendation. And they will be spread across all of state government. It's not just higher education. Thank you. So the legislature passed a budget that gives us $100. The state is looking at a $1.3 billion deficit in revenues over the next two years. They may come back and say, I want, I'm, not, I'm only going to give you $95. That's the effect of an allotment. Is that right, Mr. Carter? Yeah, that, that's a pretty good uh, explanation. Any other questions for Mr. Carter? Uh, I have a question, Mr. Chair. Uh, Trustee Lawson. 
Exactly. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carter, it's my understanding that uh, should Congress pass the HEROES Act, that the states are to receive the stimulus injection to prevent this issue, correct? It, I, I think that is correct. That's a federal issue, and, and I don't attract federal legislation for the college. Right. And so do we have means to lobby our U.S. senators to vote in favor of the HEROES Act? I know there's the Governmental Affairs Committee that has been doing that. Yeah, there's a task force uh, for government affairs, but they don't they don't lobby. Um, and, and I don't uh, maybe Kate Allen, if she's on, might want to respond. I'm on. Are you able to hear me? Oh, yes. Dr. Weber is going to answer first, Kate. No problem. Act does have a provision in there that in order to receive the funds, folks are not to reduce funding or states, organizations, whomever it may be. But there is an extenuating circumstance clause in there, and that is what a lot of organizations are exercising. And so, uh, yes, the legislation does say you are not to make cuts unless there's extenuating circumstances. Uh, okay, I couldn't really hear that. Um, I will go over the transcript when uh, we get that back. So Dick Carter, the uh, last question I have is, is there a possibility that some colleges could close? Uh, and then, you know, how much of the 700 is just unrealized services? Uh, we use less services as, you know, we well for the less income during the uh, COVID period. Yeah, I'm not a, in a position to answer whether other colleges uh, might close or, or not. Um, so that, that, that's really something that's way beyond uh, my scope of, of where we're at in the budgeting process and what other community college budgets uh, look like. Thank you, Mr. Carter. I, oh, uh, Dr. Sobchak. I think as loud. Uh, Trustee Lawson, in response to your question, which is a good one. Um, all community colleges, um, their, I guess you could say their, their funding um, formats are a little different. Um, in our case, for example, I believe, and I'm sure Dr. Weber can correct me on this, we're about 65% locally funded. That is extraordinary anywhere in the country, let alone in, let alone in Kansas. Uh, some schools are way, way more dependent upon those state dollars. Those are the ones who are gonna be taking a hit. They're the ones that are gonna have some real challenges. In our case, we we can probably get by. It's not going to hurt us so much because I believe our state funding is around what 12%, 15? Yeah, it's about 14 to 16 percent. 14 to 16. At one time it was over 20 percent. So um, it's, a, it's, it's a tough issue and I can assure you that community colleges are um, are very, very concerned about this. Jason, are we ready to go back? Okay, we're going to try to move back to the uh, open forum section of the meeting where public comments are presented. Um, I'm going to go back to, let's see, Christy spoke, Colleen spoke. Ms. Ms. Ball, are you still on the Zoom? Val, could, if you're on there, could you speak up so our techs can see if they can hear you? We'll try one more. Uh, the next registered speaker was Luella Walker. Luella Walker. Luella, are you on the Zoom? And if so, could you, once you get hooked up with speaker privileges, could you please uh, identify yourself by name and address? Okay. I'm not seeing her in the list. Okay, we'll come back to Ms. Walker. The last, uh, Jay Moyer. Jay, are you on the Zoom? And if hey, so, can, you, you, can you hear me? Yes, this is Val Ball. Yes. Val, was that you?
I'm fairly convinced we're going to have our next meeting in the boardroom with sufficient social distancing or by Zoom, because I know our techs are doing the best they possibly can. Uh, Jay Moyer, Jay, are you available on Zoom? I'm on Zoom. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. If you speak up louder, that would be even better. Jay, please okay. give us your name and address, and then I will start your three minutes. I will give you All right. if, if, if you will go slower and louder. I'm not going to hold anybody to three minutes. Will do. Um, my name is Jay Moyer. I live at 8099 Drive. That's in Overland Park, Kansas, 66204. I wanted, I wanted to take, to take a, minute a minute to recognize, to recognize this, this month, month as Pride, Pride Month. month. On the eve of Juneteenth, along with this month not only being the anniversary of the Stonewall riots started by a trans woman of color, but also the same month gay marriage was legalized, and also now the month sexuality and gender orientation were added as protected classes, and seeing continuing protests over the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, Along, Along with, with an unfortunate, unfortunate amount of our friends who are Black, Black Indigenous, Indigenous people of color being, being brutalized, brutalized and murdered, I felt I that in this June, June meeting, meeting, it would be important, important to talk about allyship and, and what it means to be an ally. I, I want to point out now, that this is a very important topic for a school board to be discussed. Education, especially post-high school education, is an important facet of American society. We would not function without it. But there are ways in which I believe our education system sometimes fails our society, especially underprivileged communities, such as our Black, Indigenous, People of Color friends, and the LGBTQ plus community, such as economic resources and colleges that are fearless allies. What is a fearless ally, you may ask? It's easy. It's someone who is anti-racist and anti-homophobic, ideas that are becoming more and more prominent in today's day and age. In order to be anti-racist or anti bigoted in general, you must seek to understand every way in which members of each underprivileged community are suffering or more at risk to oppression based on your own actions. I will not speak for members of any community but my own, because that is not my story to tell. I cannot speak for Black, Indigenous, people of color, for disabled people, or for members of the opposite sex, because I have never experienced the evidence of oppression that they have. But in the spirit of Pride Month, I will speak towards my own experiences as a member of the LGBTQ plus community. When in when high school, school, I sat, I sat next to a student who called me the s every, every single day. day. This, this led to feelings of depression, depression a lack of self-worth, and hatred for my identity. identity. What, what made things worse is, is how the how school, school refused to do anything, anything about, about it, it, claiming they couldn't. couldn't. My first my question to the board is this. Do you have policies in place to protect students from this type of bullying? If so, if so, do you do believe you they are strong, strong enough? enough? Do they, do they serve, serve your, your underprivileged students? students? Or in or other words, words, are they, they anti-bigoting? Anti or, or are they just passive? Will, 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 will you, you do, do as a board, 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 will you choose to do in the future if you have discriminatory problems? Will you take direct action? If you believe your policies don't well enough serve members of underprivileged communities, will you commit today to drafting new school legislation to solve these problems? Another point I'd like to make is a message a school sent, and I will use JCCC as an example. This school does business with at least two companies who have less than desirable ratings with the Human Rights Campaign. One is Chick-fil-A, who is known for donating millions of dollars to openly homophobic and transphobic charities and organizations. The college could choose to do business with any other fast food company, a favorite of mine being Raisin Kings, but it continues to renew its contact with Chick-fil-A. Another company is the school's paper supplier, Veritas, who has a mere 20% rating with the Human Rights Campaign's business survey, sent out to all Fortune 500 and Fortune 1000 companies. 
People, People defend, defend the use, the use of the company, company arguing, arguing that they that simply they didn't, didn't fill out the survey, survey causing, causing their, their business, business score. score. But, but that, that also sends me red flags. flags. Why did this company not fill out the survey? Did they just not care? Or, even worse, did they know that if they did fill out the survey, they were not going to get a good score, so they just neglected to do it? That sends a bad message. And the fact that the college is doing business with them gives me pause as well. This is not an anti-bigoted stance. This message the college sends is important in order to be viewed as an ally. People, People of underprivileged under communities, communities must feel safe, safe choosing a school and attending. And attending. If you are, you are not, not taking an anti-bigoted anti -bigoted stance, stance. How, how safe do you presume students will really feel? feel. Now, now is not the time to make excuses. Now, now is not, not the time to speak over other people. people. And now, now is not, not the time to call yourself an ally, especially if you don't act like one. If a, if a member of an underprivileged community calls you out for an action that is problematic, it is, it is not within your right to push them to the side. You must listen to them, and you must serve them accordingly. I urge the school, and specifically this board, to think about these issues as they continue to have productive and difficult conversations. And, and to include more members of these underprivileged communities, communities and, and to welcome, welcome them at the table, table and weigh, weigh their voices their seriously when discussion issues that um, when, um, they when they discuss they issues that affect them directly. directly. Thank you Thank for your time. Thank you, Thank you, Jay. Our last registered speaker is Daryl Burton. Pastor Burton, are you on the Zoom? Val is also available. Um, I don't have the other speaker queued up yet. If you want to go, okay. To um, we'll we'll go back to Val Ball. Val, can you hear me? I can hear you, although it's really weird. We we seem to be able to hear you. Again, if you will speak up and speak slowly, I will give you extra time. Can you hear me now? Yes. Please state okay. your name. And so I will go ahead with my statements. Please go. Um, so I am... With my goal, Val, Val, hopefully I'm you're here tonight. We're not hearing you, Val. If you could hold on for just a second. <laughs> I'm just letting you know where we're at. Okay, Val, would you call over, please? Um, um, address. Hi, my name is Val Ball. I live at 11724 West, 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 West 50 West, Kansas, 66203. And if you drive by my house, you will see signs in my front yard that say end white silence about white violence. The reason I'm here to speak to you tonight is to end that white silence. I'm here to ask Johnson County Community College what you're going to do to address the systemic racism that exists in our community college. The entire reason that Johnson County Community College exists is due to white flight, white privilege, and systemic racism. It's here because Val, well, I'm sorry, we're not getting that, and it indicates it's a bandwidth issue 
on your computer. I, I think what we're going to ask everybody to do is to email their statements. They will be circulated to each of the trustees immediately when we receive them all. Actually, the email address to use is president at jccc.edu. President at jccc.edu. We will include those with the transcript of today's meeting and attach them to the minutes. I apologize. It is an issue of technology, both on either end sometimes and sometimes in the middle. So, Val, if you would please do that. Um, that is the only way we can accept your statement at this time. Mr. Chair, I can have somebody call me or to be able to listen. I don't know what's going on. Well, I, I don't, I don't think you can turn them into the speaker that we can hear. So we're going to ask all members of the open comment period to send their statements. The address I indicated, we have your emails too from your registration. So we will email that address to you so that you have it on your email. Hello. Hello. Okay. Here, here you go. If you want to speak. Okay. Just a minute, Trustee Lawson. Go on. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, my name is Adija Suleiman. Okay, just a minute. My address is 53 West 132nd Terrace, Overland Park, Kansas 66209. I come to you as a former student, a mother, a resident, and a productive uh, member of this community. I want to thank Trustee Lawson for giving me this opportunity to come um, and speak in front of the board of trustees. Um, and my intention here is to appeal to the board of trustees and in echoing what every other speaker has shared in that we really want to make sure that um, the issue of Title IX and Black Lives Matter and protection of people from different backgrounds, races, sexual orientation are considered and protected. Um, as a productive member of this community, I could not have done it without going through Johnson County Community College uh, for my first two years um, in college. I had a great time there. However, times have certainly changed from the time I was there 15 years ago to now. What I ask, I kindly ask of uh, the Board of Trustees is please keep in mind that this is the time to stand up and be a voice, not just for those who look like you or believe what you believe, but really the underserved, underrepresented um, members of the minority community here in Johnson County. Your voice and your actions, they go a long way. Um, many children, we don't know what they're going through at home. Now we know that we, they go through a lot, whether it's through the police or even discriminatory behaviors in, the, in this very own community of ours. So I would love for Johnson County Community College to be that safe space where paying members of the community who are in most cases younger people and even adults are coming there to, to a safe space where they can focus on continuing or starting their education because those experiences at your campus go a long way in shaping who they will be later on. Again, I did not have a, a written script. I wanted to come to you um, from the heart as a member of this community, as a product of your school, um, and also now as a mother of four young children who all have college ambitions. Um, thank you so much for your time. And again, thank you so much, Trustee Lawson uh, and your whole team for all you're doing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, this individual was on the list, but this was unable to connect via the Zoom because she did not receive a link. Uh, so she called me directly to uh, make that statement. I think that you guys could hear her uh, fine. So I can also do that to the other uh, members that were supposed to be speaking. Well, it did, it, did you solicit Luella Walker so that she could call you as well and use your phone? 
Point of order, Mr. Chair, please do not make a tax at me. I am trying to make sure that the public has an opportunity to speak, and I think I'm doing that. Several speakers have mentioned that you contacted them. I think it's excellent that they're participating in our meeting. I'm trying to figure out how we connect technolo technologically, and if you can do that, that would be beneficial to all of us. Uh, point of order, Mr. Chair, I have not heard many. I've heard one person talk about that, uh, so please make sure to be accurate. I'll do my best. Mr. Chair? Yes. Can you hear me? Can I, I can hear you. Who is this? This is Laura. I'm in the room with oh, you. I'm I'm sorry, you're just an echo like everybody else. <laughs> Trustee Smith Everett. Can I ask for clarity for the next meeting what the appropriate, when someone registers as a speaker during our open forum, what should happen? They receive a Zoom link that allows them to be identified and promoted as a speaker when they are identified so that they can speak during that period of time and the rest of the meeting they will be an observer or a, a, just a, a participant. And I don't think it's the fact that the Zoom links were wrong. There, there are issues with technology and bandwidth on their end and connections to ours um, that have proven to be more difficult than I think anybody anticipated today. So they need to go to our website log on with the link that's provided for the board meeting that everybody in the public can be can click on and then once we see their name appear as a somebody just participate just watching then you will promote them to speaker when it's the open forum time is that correct okay i think that may be part of our misunderstanding with some of the speakers. They thought they were going to be sent something and when they didn't get sent something, then we're trying alternative channels. Yep. So I would just wanted to know for the next meeting in case anyone asks. Uh, I'm sure Chris and his team will look at the website and make sure the instructions are as clear as possible. Okay, um, Val, you can go. Okay. Trustee Cross. Hi. Yeah. Again, my name is Val Ball. Awesome. Could you ask her to hold Railing on for a minute, please? 1724 West 54 Terrace in Shawnee, Kansas. If you drive by my house, you'll see homemade yard signs that say end white silence about white violence. On the other side, which aren't facing the street, they say show up for racial justice and Black Lives Matter. And what I'm here to do is end white silence about systemic racism at Johnson County Community College. Johnson County Community College only exists because white people, quote my aunt, the colored started moving in. Johnson County is the epitome of white privilege and it's the epitome of systemic racism. Anyone that has ever gotten a ticket in Leewood or Prairie Village or Westwood knows that we have border patrol on our county that pulls over people of color with plates for Missouri. And in Shawnee, Mission and Merriam, they pull over people of color with Wyandotte plates. If you go to those courts, on any day they have traffic, you will see that those, some of the wealthiest cities in Johnson County, have lines of people of color paying fees and fines to these same cities, increasing the racial wealth gap constantly. Besides Johnson County Community College not having diversity and equity and inclusion statements and committees and all the things that I know some trustees have worked really hard to bring to the attention of the board being shamed and ostracized for trying to end that white silence about what we are doing. Yes, we white evangelicals are doing to people of color. Additionally, Johnson County Community College 
is the home of the actual police academy that trains the police in this county that act as border patrol. And I personally have friends of color who refuse to drive into Kansas because they are very aware that they will get pulled over just for driving while black. Just because we haven't had a police officer murder a black person in our county does not mean that we do not have racism here. It is permeated through the entire structure of everything in Johnson County. Prairie Village deeds still have caveats in them that do not allow for black people to get loans and own property in that town. What is Johnson County Community College going to do to be a leader in addressing systemic racism, especially considering that Johnson County has a great conflict resolution mediation program that all mediators who want to get approved by the state of Kansas have to take their courses at Johnson County Community College. And I want to know why Johnson County Community College is not having those mediators train police officers in de-escalation tactics and to resolve conflicts without the use of violence. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ball. Uh, has Luella Walker appeared on any Zoom link? Luella Walker. I am not seeing that name. Okay. Uh, Daryl uh, Burton. Burton. I'm not seeing that one either. Trustee Cross. Cross. Yeah, I just wanted to comment, Mr. Chair, just note for the record that, that we've gone nearly an hour uh, based on the uh, open forum section here. I, I don't remember that ever happening in my career, seven years now on July 1. I want to thank you for your leadership, Mr. Chair, and literally to note for the record, I'm used to being in court, we have to articulate things that you see in mannerisms and the shaking. Uh, just to note the record, the hustle, 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 hustle. in this unprecedented time, uh, the effort that I think everyone has put forward. Um, I think it's clear that Trustee Lawson, many of these people have spoken for her and with her in the past. I appreciate she organizing them and bringing them forward in this historic time. Uh, but I did just want to note uh, and, and appreciate the chair's patience. And uh, I've got many texts that we've lost control of the meeting. I disagree. I think it's a time of unparalleled social tumult and I appreciate your leadership and how you've handled this meeting. I just wanted to note that for the record and, and for all of our staff who put forth so much effort. Thank you. I, I agree with respect to our staff. I didn't know it was news when I lost control of a meeting. No, I'm not saying <laughs> I, I know I know you're not I know you're not Lee. You're doing uh, fine. Yeah we're we're into the meeting a ways but that's okay. Important comments. Uh, Dr. Liker are you ready for the faculty association report? I think you're going to be at the podium, and I don't know what that means as far as technology, but please share your thoughts. Yeah, the way this is going, I'm not <laughs> sure if anybody outside of the room can see me or hear me, but I'm just going to go forward like people are listening. I'm used to that after 28 years of college <laughs> teaching. So. so thank you, Mr. Musil and members of the board. It's good to be back on campus, even in this limited setting. Several of my colleagues have expressed sadness at these circumstances of not physically seeing one another and having the hallway run-ins that we're so used to. I've always believed that the best ideas happen accidentally, and while accidental ideas can happen, I guess, in Zoom meetings, you'll probably agree that it's not the same. Before I address a few specifics as they pertain to our local situation, I'd like to raise some concerns as to what's been happening in the national and the global context. And this will mirror some of the comments that you've heard tonight in the open forum. The Chronicle of Higher Ed this week ran a story titled, The Coming Campus Protests. 
claiming that in the wake of George Floyd's death, activists will be demanding more systemic and structural changes to increase diversity in colleges and universities. JCCC is not alone in that if it wants to be ahead of the curve, it will require working closely with faculty and staff, especially those with appropriate expertise. I would be a bad representative of my own area of humanities and social sciences if I didn't point out that fields like ours engage all the time with the kinds of problems to which the demonstrations have been calling our national attention. I would also be a very bad professor of African American studies if I didn't point out that tomorrow is Juneteenth. So I will offer extra credit to the first trustee who can explain to me um, what the origin of that is. And you can use your phones, you can Google it. My students do that all the time. Laura, did I see a hand go up? Yes. Go for it. It was when um, Texas um, slaves found out that they were freed and it was finally announced to them. And I don't remember how far it was from the actual legislation. 1865. Passed, but it was 11 months, was it? Yeah, like After they were supposed to be. Very good. Um, I'm gonna pass along a suggestion from my fellow historian, Ty Edwards, that tomorrow be a paid day off in honor of Juneteenth day. So don't dismiss that idea. Um, you've got all night to think about it. <laughs> A fine start on this was made two weeks ago when Dr. Sopcich's office issued a statement in support of racial justice, which was quickly followed by similar statements from the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force, the Academic Branch Council, and of course, the Faculty Association. Statements like these are meaningless unless they carry some tooth in the days ahead. But in the meantime, I thank Dr. Sopcich for taking the lead. And while I'm at it, I'll just thank Dr. Sopcich. So this is your last meeting as president. Trust me when I say that you will be missed. You and I have had our disagreements. We didn't always understand as a faculty the moves that you were making, and I don't think you always understood ours either. But most of us never once doubted your commitment to this institution and to the students and your good intentions. So I hope you leave here feeling proud of the work that you've done. And I say this with some envy. Um, I wish you a happy retirement. Uh, Jim, Dr. Likert, thank you so much. Um, coming from you, as I've said before, when you've sent me some um, very constructive and positive emails, uh, coming from you, that means a great deal because I know you don't dish those out uh, lightly. So thank you for all the work that you do here. Um, I know you're one of the better teachers uh, on campus, much appreciated, and I've always enjoyed um, our discussion. So thanks for the kind words. Thank you. So this past month marked the end of the most unusual semester in our history. It's no exaggeration to say faculty were taxed to their collective limits. Some made the transition to online instruction quite smoothly. Others who were accustomed to more face-to-face -face methods scrambled to become competent with Canvas, UGIM, Zoom, and other packages that helped us reach the finish line. This could not have occurred without the tremendous work of Ed Lovett and his staff in the Educational Technology Center who provided emergency training to those who needed it. Although the FA does not represent them, I wanna give a shout out to our adjunct faculty, many of whom hurry to complete iTeach training to gain eligibility for online summer and fall classes. And at least to date, they took on that extra training with no additional compensation. Not only did a thousand innovations have to happen at the level of individual instruction, but chairs and deans invested dozens of unanticipated hours redoing the summer and fall schedules for their departments and divisions. Not every course and program was able to finish the spring through virtual delivery. There are several in the career and technical areas that require students and faculty to return in July and complete what we're calling summer teach outs. These classes will happen in labs and classrooms with lower capacities because of recommended social distancing. It was and is the FA's position that any deal which returns nine month faculty during an off contract season requires additional compensation, which in turn requires negotiation. Now, before someone argues that those faculty were paid through spring for classes that were not completed, I'll point out that faculty's job extends far beyond the classroom. It involves staying current in their respective fields, planning for the year ahead, and in some cases, rearranging spaces to accommodate industry-specific guidelines. 
I'm happy to say that the FAA worked with Dr. McLeod and HR to reach a contract proposal, which we submitted to the bargaining unit. I'll admit I was a little nervous about obtaining the required ratification votes for a contract that affected a small handful of faculty at a time when most of our members were off contract and not responding to campus communications like they normally would. So I was very surprised pleasantly at the remarkable turnout and the overwhelming number of votes cast in favor of the deal, which you are voting to affirm later tonight. Those are a few examples of how we've stepped up during this crisis. Here are a few others. In May, Jeffrey Odom, adjunct professor of environmental science, suggested a poll to determine how well faculty made the transition to virtual delivery. FA has been working on a survey with one of our representatives through one of our representatives, Ron Palcic, who has been working in turn with Farrell Janab to craft a survey that asks questions like, how many hours did you spend learning new technology? What resources did the college make available to you? What out of pocket expenses did you incur? For the record, my wife and I purchased another personal computer when it became clear to us that the one was not going to be effective for two people teaching from home. And don't worry, I have no plans to um, ask the college for compensation for that, at least not at the moment. At the suggestion of accounting professor and aspiring politician Dave Krug, FA has also been working with institutional effectiveness on a student survey. Jessica Garcia from Counseling and Michelle Salvato from Psychology are part of a team to get answers from students themselves as to how spring 2020 turned out for them. We hear a lot of anecdotal and not particularly scientific information about how the college handled instruction during the shutdown. It's my hope that these surveys will produce the knowledge and the insights we need in the likely event of a repetition this coming fall. The Academic Branch Council, henceforth known as the ABC, is in full operation. If you recall, this was the group approved by faculty to implement shared governance in the academic branch as per the requirements of the Higher Learning Commission. Jim Hopper was instrumental in leading that task force through its formative year. Tanya Hughes from Film and Photography and Heather Seitz from Science will serve as co-chairs in the year ahead. FA will retain its authority on matters pertaining to the master agreement but on non-contractual items, FA will be working closely with ABC to improve vertical communication and move us closer to those shared governance goals that the HLC expects of us. I know, I know, FA, ABC, HLC, it sounds like alphabet soup. There have also been examples of where collaboration could use improvement. It's not my style to call out the problems of specific areas from a podium unless I have to. Suffice to say, much of my time this past month has been occupied in meetings with faculty telling me that reopening decisions are being made with little or no input from them. We understand the challenges of bringing employees back to campus in safe, effective ways that limit liability. But this is really a case of where the college's eyes need to be just as focused on the leaves as on the forest. Decisions about lab maintenance, maximum numbers in classrooms and offices, physical proximity between faculty and students and students to each other are better when they involve the people who know those spaces intimately and will be tapping toes with the public on a daily basis. If the spring semester had some successes, it was because administration listened and accepted flexibility as the norm. That spirit of listening and professional confidence will be needed again if reopening will work. In many ways, I see the next six months as the ultimate test of what the HLC charged us to do, namely move away from the practice of management by mandate. Lastly, I'm going to wax philosophical and repeat a point I made on the FA listserv when I succeeded Melanie Harvey. In my 18 years here, I've seen two visions of JCCC struggle to compete with one another. One is a vision of the college as a physical space with first class facilities and magnificently endowed buildings. That's the vision benefactors and casual visitors see and typically the one most invoked when they describe us. Over the last three months, that vision has been as empty as these buildings. It's the second vision that has sustained us 
JCCC is defined by its people. If not for the efforts of hundreds of employees who took the college's business into their personal spaces, some of them surrounded by small children, others investing in improved internet service and higher utility bills, it's doubtful we'd be in the place we are. It's natural that salaries and benefits would take the lion's share of the budget since people are our greatest asset. The news is full of stories about institutions like ours which will not survive the pandemic. I wonder how many of those places will fail because of poor morale. I've heard it asked by trustees more than once, what do faculty want? We recognize them all the time with awards and accolades. You know, those are nice, certainly, but after a while, they do seem kind of like cookies that you give to children for good behavior. We'll take the awards and the accolades. Who says no to a cookie? But what we're really wanting is what all professionals want. Control over the areas in which we have expertise, competitive salary and benefits, and a seat at the table when important decisions are being made. That concludes my report. I will stand for questions. Thank you, Dr. Liker. Are there questions from the board? I'll start with at this side. So I have to look at you since you're so far away. Trustee Smith Everett, anything? Yes. Okay. Um, can you tell me how many uh, full-time faculty are on the IRT? I have to think about that. Um, the IRT being the incident, incident, incident response team. Right, that is currently doing our- I'll defer that question to Dr. Weber. So on the incident response team, there are actually no full-time faculty. On the return to campus team, there is one full-time faculty. Thank you. There you go. Trustee Lawson. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I know many companies have had Juneteenth a paid day off and it's definitely worth considering. So Mr. Chair, I'd love to make a motion that we consider making Juneteenth a paid holiday for our faculty and staff. We will, if, if you wanna bring that up during new business, we would have to have a motion to add it to the agenda and then an action on that. Um, and I, I don't think it's appropriate now to do so. But I'll, I'll, I'll call on you during new business. Okay, so new business, okay. And then Mr. Chair, I want you to know that I'm glad to say that when people ask if they could speak about the issues, I was glad to help them to find a way to speak. I know we all have a lot of on our minds and I'm proud to help our residents find a way to participate. Uh, and thank you so much, Dr. Leiker, for your presentation. Trustee Cross, do you have something? I was just gonna say thank you to Professor um, Leiker. I've known him for years and I know he's been a huge advocate for the college and um, Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jim. Uh, the next item is the Johnson County Education Research Triangle Report, Trustee Cross. Uh, I don't really have a report, Mr. Chair. I, we have not met since uh, we last met. Uh, we will meet on the uh, 35th anniversary of Game Five of the 19, Game Six of the 1985 World Series at K State Olathe. Questions for Trustee Cross. If none, we'll move for, on to the Kansas. For those of us that don't know when that was. Oh, in, in it's also available online, Trustee uh, Smith Everett okay. uh, at the Johnson County Ed Education Research Triangle. It's October 26th, Thank you. 1985. I was going for October, but that's as limited as my hit. baseball knowledge. It was a big deal in Royals history. There's some call at first base. I, All right, now, now I have lost control. Um, <laughs> Trustee Ingram, Kansas Association of Community College Trustees. I'll bring you back. Thank you. Um, Kansas Association of Community College Trustees met on June the 6th, and I'll just provide some highlights from that meeting. It was a Zoom meeting, and um, I don't know that we have a number of the full attendance there, but 17 of the 19 community colleges did have representation at the meeting. It was announced that the executive director's evaluation had been completed with many favorable comments being given about Heather's performance this year. And I, I would just remind everyone that we do have a new executive director who has just completed her first year. She's been extremely helpful and uh, has provided great leadership throughout the state. Um, we did have some additional business manners in addition to simply the approval of the minutes and the, the uh, treasurer's report. There was a motion to approve an extension of contracts with Divine, Donnelly and Murray, who is our lobbyist firm and also with our accountant. In addition to that, David Marshall, who is our treasurer, spoke to the 2021 
uh, proposed budget. He stated that it would be a flat budget, which basically means that will be very similar to the, uh, to the 1920 budget. The primary reason being that community colleges may be experiencing deficits in both enrollment and funding. So we're looking at all sorts of efficiencies that we can create. Um, due to existing and unforeseen effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, it was recommended by our executive director that the annual KACCT fees remain flat as well, and that was approved. Um, in addition, Heather provided some legislative updates, which were very similar to those already provided by Mr. Carter. Uh, the meeting was then open to comments from participants regarding their plans for the reopening of their respective institutions. As you can imagine, there were a variety of different options and many at this point uh, still had a lot of questions. We discussed the return of foreign students to campuses, uh, international students. Some colleges were planning on quarantining those students prior to the beginning of classes and some voiced again, they are just simply unsure. There's still just so much uncertainty. Another uh, issue addressed was the handling of students who lack the necessary technology to complete online coursework. Um, it was mentioned that oftentimes these students were given laptops and recommendations for hotspots in their area so they could in fact complete that coursework. Heather reported that the Council of Presidents met the day before on June the 5th. She stated uh, that a majority of the meeting was focused on the recent national attention to the tragic death of George Floyd. Those in attendance at this meeting called for KCCT to issue a statement which would reflect the organization's stand on racial, racial conflict and resolution. We did vote on one and it is on our KACCT.org website. As a final order of business, Heather explained to everyone that KACCT was suspending the sponsorship of the KCCLI, which is the leadership in, uh, initiative for the upcoming academic year to, due to financial reasons. Um, Jackie Vietti, who has been the program coordinator, has uh, created plans for continuing the program, which we were very pleased about. We did not want to discontinue that program. We just wanted to give it a year break. Uh, but she will be working on that program and I believe it's going to be $200 per attendee. So it will be very affordable this year. Uh, with a few introductions of new liaisons to the organization, the meeting was adjourned. So it was a good, good meeting. And I will answer any questions if anyone has any. We have continued to participate in phone calls throughout uh, all of this. There were legislative phone calls on Fridays and the executive officers have been a, a part of that with the Council of Presidents. So we're all working very co cooperatively. Thank you, Trustee Ingram, for leading that organization as president. Not a problem. Um, and I, I think it's worth reminding ourselves that that is funded by so much per student. I don't know the amount, but given enrollment issues at other colleges, it will be interesting comes our September meeting to find out what percentage of funding comes from Johnson County as we've reviewed that kind of over the years. Right. I can tell you since we met, which was just a little over a week ago, um, we have made plans to close the office in Topeka. Um, our lease expires the end of December, I believe, and we will no longer have an office over there. Um, Heather lives in Wamego and she's working out of her home, which as many people have figured out, it's it's been doable for her and she would uh, she made that recommendation and we did accept that. So I will share that with you. Okay. Um, you are next up on the foundation. Yes. Johnson County Community College Foundation, Trustee Ingram. Yes, the uh, foundation, foundation continues to successfully accomplish important work on behalf of our students uh, during this challenging time. A few examples of some of the important work that has occurred recently include uh, through partnership with financial aid, more than 200 students have received emergency funds from the foundation's COVID-19 response scholarship. The foundation in partnership with donors has made $75,000 available to this point with additional funds that can be made available as needed. The foundation successfully partnered with JCCC to purchase 60 new laptops for students for the new loaner laptop program. In May, the foundation successfully transferred the needed funds and the laptops have been purchased by JCCC. In addition to maintaining all standard operations while working remotely, the staff has been working to enhance and expand the information in our database of JCCC supporters. This included the addition of nearly 2,500 email addresses and updating contact information of nearly 1,500 donors of gifts in recent years. 
The goal was to improve options for regular communications with donors and to improve efficiencies in using information from the base. It has been refreshing and rewarding to touch base with so many wonderful supporters as they have done. On May 19th, the foundation held its first ever virtual annual luncheon with the support of the wonderful video services team. The plane went, went off without a hitch. So we wanna thank everyone who assisted with that. We also wanna share some preliminary good news. This is information not typically announced this time of the year, but they were excited to share it with opportunities continuing to exist for scholarships to be awarded for summer courses. The foundation did a receive to date figure for the amount of foundation scholarship funds that have been awarded to students during the 1920 academic year. While not finalized yet, we anticipate that more than $1.3 million will have been awarded in foundation scholarships during 1920, surpassing that $1.3 million mark for the first time in our history. Exact final figures are typically available in September following the completion of summer courses. The foundation continues to work each day to adapt and plan for upcoming events, such as the annual harvest dinner, lace up for learning, beyond bounds, and of course, some enchanted evening. As plans are finalized for each of these important events, more information will of course be shared. We encourage everyone to watch the foundation website online for updates and information about how to support our students during this time. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Trustee Ingram. Any questions about the foundation? If not, we'll move into committee reports and recommendations. The first one is the audit committee. The only thing in your packet is the minutes from the meeting uh, that was held in uh, May. We reported on the contents of that meeting, or I did, uh, during our May trustee meeting. Uh, Human Resources, Trustee Ingram. Yes. Uh, the Human Resources Committee Zoom meeting was held on Friday, June 5th. Uh, Ms. Becky Sentlever, Vice President, Human Resources, reviewed the proposed Human Resources Committee working agenda for 2020-2021, which is found on page eight of the packet. Therefore, Mr. Chair, that is our first recommendation. It is the recommendation of the Human Resources Committee that the Board of Trustees approve the Human Resources Committee working agenda for 2020-2021, as is shown subsequently in the board packet. And I will make that motion. Moved by Trustee Ingram, seconded by uh, Trustee Snyder to approve the working agenda that appears on page eight of the board packet. Is there any discussion? <clears throat> if not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any one opposed say nay. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Mr. Jerry Zimmerman, Manager Benefits, reviewed the significant amount of recent federal legislation pronouncements related to COVID-19 that impacted JCCC benefits between March and May of this year. That includes the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, FFRCA, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, which is the CARES Act, and Internal Revenue Service Notice 2020-29. Other benefit plan changes include Delta Dental rescinded their 4% premium increase for the 2020-2021 benefit year, and our vision plan provider, IMED, is allowing participants with any unused benefits for the benefit year ending on May 31st, 2020, to incur and submit expenses through August 31st, 2020. Ms. Julie Vivas, Manager of Employee Relations, gave background information reviewed the numerous needed policy changes and procedural changes based upon the new Title IX regulations. The Department of Education released their final regulations for the Title IX in May with an implementation date of August 14, 2020. We will be asking the policy and procedure changes to be approved at the July board meeting. She also reviewed the different projects that are being worked on to make sure the college is in compliance with the new regulations by the August 14th implementation date. As a result of those implementations, we will meet on Friday, July 10th at 8 a.m. Ms. Colleen Chandler, Director of Human Resources, reminded everyone that policy 422.02 requires annual training for all employees, including non-discrimination, anti-harassment training, technology security, and campus safety awareness training and any other required trainings as determined by the needs of the college or the employee's department. 
for fiscal year 2020, the required training program included discrimination awareness in the workplace, Title IX and sexual misconduct, campus safety and FERPA, and email and messaging safety. For fiscal year 2021, the required training program will include diversity and inclusion, sexual harassment, cybersecurity overview, email and messaging safety, FERPA, enrollment management, and ALICE emergency preparedness. Employees are also required to complete coronavirus awareness training by June 30th, 2020, or prior to their return to campus. Ms. Sentlever reviewed the memorandum of understanding with the JCCC Faculty Association for a spring 2020 incomplete completion for spring 2020 professor stipend race, rates and formulas as is shown subsequently in the board packet on page seven. We have a recommendation regarding that mem memorandum of understanding and I will now present that. The Human Resources Committee recommends that the Board of Trustees accept the College Administration's recommendation to authorize a memorandum of understanding with the JCCC Faculty Association for a spring 2020 completion stipend as is shown subsequently in the board packet. This memo of understanding applies to the spring 2020 courses only and I will make that motion. Second. Moved by Trustee Ingram and seconded by Trustee Smith Everett to approve the recommendation for the stipend for uh, faculty who continue teaching their spring courses effectively in the summer. Uh, is there any discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I have some questions about the statement that was raised in these minutes. It sounds like they're advocating um, for the adoption of these new rules for Title IX, and I just want to make sure that that is not something that's actually been decided yet. So I want to make sure that we are not putting that out there to the public, that that is actually happening right now. I know uh, that... Lawson, that we're, we're acting on the, mo the different motion now. You'll have an opportunity to raise that question before the repair is over, but we're now acting on the stipend for the faculty association. And the, the memo, memo the memorandum. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Chair. Trustee Cross. Just a question. I mean, this all went pretty smoothly. I'm not on audit. I'm just asking this, this memorandum was negotiated. It, it's the memorandum that trustee, or that trustee Liker, uh, President Liker mentioned day, that was negotiated between the faculty <laughs> association and Dr. McLeod on behalf of the administration. And I, I think it, as you indicated, it did go smoothly and the faculty association has endorsed it and would like us to pass it. Uh, it carries the same legal weight as a three-year contract. Um, Melanie Harvey and I, for uh, expediency's sake, um, served as the negotiating team. And yes, I would characterize it as, as a smooth negotiation. That's it, I just appreciate it. There's no further discussion all in favor of adopting or agreeing to the memorandum of understanding with the faculty association say aye. 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 Any anyone in opposed say opposition say nay. That motion carries unanimously. We'll let Trustee Ingram finish her report, Trustee Lawson, and then come back to your question. Thank you. Dr. Randy Weber, Interim EVP of Finance and Administration, Vice President, Student Success and Engagement, gave an overview of the return to campus plan and guidelines. Step two began June 1st, allowing beyond essential function employees whose roles necessitated preparing campus for the return of individuals in step three, which is targeted to begin June 22nd. Individuals are not to congregate in groups larger than 30, each department prior to returning is submitting a plan for consideration and approval by the IRT. Plans include the purchase and distribution of PPE for each work unit and what is expected of each employee. Signs are being placed all around the campus. The coronavirus awareness mandatory training is underway. As mentioned previously, the next Human Resources Committee is scheduled for Friday, July 10th, 2020 at a location to be determined. And uh, Mr. Chairman, that does include my report, uh, conclude my report, excuse me, unless Trustee Smith Everett has anything to offer. But um, I think that's the sole purpose of us meeting on the 10th is to discuss, um, you know, where we're going with some of those. Is that not correct? Yes, I, I was gonna just clarify that too, if you, if you want to, that we have a special uh, HR meeting scheduled to address the title. Um, nine changes 
and the proposed, um, I guess, adoption for Johnson County Community College um, and how we will adopt those new regulations in uh, on in July at the right new, any new policy or procedures you bet that we would right yeah. and these as I understand it these are policies or procedures we have to adopt to be in compliance with the new federal regulations uh, do we perceive these as undermining any of our continuing and ongoing efforts to ensure that title lines non-discrimination and our anti-discrimination policies are followed no changes to that. Trustee Lawson. There's absolutely no sound at all from uh, Becky. Okay, she basically what I think she said was we will adopt the regulations or our policies to meet the regulations. But otherwise, there will be no changes in how we treat um, that topic as a college. Correct. We will have to change some of our procedures, but we still have the resources available to all the people, employees, and students. Could you hear that, Angelina? Uh, no, just whatever you uh, speak back. Um, basically, all the same resources and programs will be available to all uh, members of the campus community. Uh, we will change the policy simply so that they meet the federal regulations. Is that accurate, Becky? Can you talk in a new microphone? Yes, that's accurate. Did you hear Angelina? Just a little bit, yeah. Is okay. there anything else that she has to say before I could say something? No. No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, there are 18 different state attorney generals right now and several community colleges and advocacy groups, of course, that have signed on to lawsuits against the Department of Education. Uh, these rules proposed by uh, Secretary DeVos have, of course, one goal, and that's to make it nearly impossible for uh, women to report sexual violence without the fear of retribution. Um, the Washington Post noted that these rules uh, silence survivors by giving the accused more control. Ted Mitchell, who's the president of of ACCT uh, and the Education Council has asked all the community colleges and the trustees for a timeline on this rule to be able to be suspended uh, due to COVID virus. So there is an active attempt to try and push back and not just accept wholeheartedly uh, with, of course, the 18 states in suit, national organizations, all of which are we are members of, uh, being broadly opposed, I will vote no uh, when this comes up because I think that we have time here to really address and come to a rethinking of do we want to join these community colleges in a suit uh, so that we can protect the rights of uh, women and or anybody who files a sexual violence uh, report. And I wanna make sure that we never uh, vote to comply with rules that are so um, set to devalue women. I believe we should sign on to the other colleges and organizations uh, and these other 18 uh, states that are opposing this. And it's really bothersome to just have a blanket uh, acceptance of something when there's a lot of movement to push back and we don't need to prematurely put this forward, but the discussion that it, there was no other way to do it is problematic. And I think that warrants to be able to have a statement that says uh, there are other people who are finding another way and I think we can join them as well. Thank you. Learning Quality, Trustee Cook. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Learning Quality met on June 1 via Zoom. Trustees Cross and Smith Everett were in attendance with a plethora of faculty, staff, uh, faculty and staff. Uh, the learning quality report can be found on pages 9 through 16 of your packet. I won't read that verbatim, uh, but we had uh, some really interesting happenings. Diana Roddinghaus gave a report on her 2019 spring sabbatical. Uh, the focus of her sabbatical was to create a collection of academic reading strategies to be available to JCC faculty working with students from all disciplines. A couple of highlights, uh, a, a great toolbox uh, for assisting students with, with reading challenges was further developed. She also did a survey of um, department chairs and based on that information, uh, put together some strategies 
to assist students who have, like I say, reading, reading challenges. Um, she's very enthusiastic about her report, uh, uh, very enthusiastic about how we approach helping students with reading challenges. Uh, the reading uh, one of the points in your report, the reading faculty made a site visit to American River College to investigate reading across disciplines, RAD program, and uh, they were very impressed with those results and will implement those, those strategies here at Johnson County Community College. Uh, Gerbershan Singh gave an update on an affiliation agreement that's found in your consent agenda, which was a continuing uh, cons uh, affiliation agreement. Um, Denise Griffey gave a report on a new uh, uh, articulation agreement with the Blue Valley School District. Dr. McLeod, I'm not sure if you want to speak to that. That's been in the works for some time. We're excited about that because that uh, enhances the number of students that we uh, will receive from the Blue Valley School District. I know you put a lot of time into that. Would you like to make a comment about that? Uh, yes, that particular agreement is designed for us to provide better counseling services to students who are interested in joining us here on the campus uh, and some of the newer programs that we've inaugurated for high school students. Uh, it will allow for the hiring of a position um, shared between Johnson County and the Blue Valley School District um, to make sure that students' uh, transcripts are in alignment and that the courses that they take here will appropriately reverse transfer for their high school credits so that we can begin working towards students completing both the high school diploma simultaneous to an AA. Appreciate that. We always uh, value re renewing affiliation agreements and always look forward to new ones emerging. Uh, we had a report from Vince Miller, Tim Laughlin, and Rochelle Quinn on, on our simulation, uh, healthcare simulation program. And uh, that was also very, very uh, enlightening and, and um, I, I would say entertaining, but I don't want you to take, the, take that wrong. But we really found a, a, a lot of detail about the simulation program. But one of the highlights is we're the only accredited uh, healthcare simulation center in Kansas. Their Metropolitan Community College is also certified, and the two of us are about a group of, of about 150 nationwide that get certified through the Society for Simulation Healthcare. Uh, and uh, Vince and Tim and Rochelle were strong to point out that with the assistance of Dr. McLeod uh, to, from the administration standpoint to help us get this approved was very instrumental. And uh, Dr. McLeod was also instrumental in getting Metropolitan Community Colleges their certification. So you're all well aware of, I think, uh, of the great work our college does in the simulation program. Uh, I, I believe you have some additional detail uh, or we can get additional detail I, I was just really impressed with the detail of that report and um, the, the passion and the excitement that the people have for our simulation center. So I, I wanna compliment them. It was a very outstanding, a very outstanding report. Uh, Dr. Weber gave a report uh, as he has in all committees on the COVID-19 campus update. And um, Dr. McLeod talked about uh, uh, the work we're doing for the summer course, which Dr. Likers talked about, referred to, and we're all been aware of the, of the great work that staff has done to accommodate uh, online learning and, and dealing with, with lab work and students that, that when we're in this quarantine basis. Uh, Karen Martley provided a review of ongoing efforts in continuing education. Uh, and I, and I, I think, Karen, you've always said of the great work the Small Business Development Center is doing with the number of requests you're getting from small business for assistance. So uh, we're very appreciative of that as well. With that, that kind of concludes my report. Uh, I, would, I would defer to Laura and to Lee uh, for your impressions of both of those reports, particularly the reading sabbatical and the health simulation. I, I didn't want to cut that short. So if you have any comments, please. Trustee Smith Everett. Um, I, I just wanted to thank the group that did the simulation. They only showed us the nicest um, <laughs> specimen. No, what, what was that? It was patients. They were the patients. No, no, no. The they showed us 
Thank sputum. you, sputum. Oh yeah, and I only showed us the part. nicest yeah. one they told us, and so I appreciated it. An eight thirty in the morning meeting, only being shown the, you know, the um, elementary version of what they could have shown us in their simulation. But the simulation was remarkable. It was eye opening, um, and I applaud that team uh, for all the work they put into it before COVID. And of course, afterwards, this is one of the main ways our nursing students are able to continue to get their hours. So thank you very much. Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Mr. Chair Cook. I appreciate that. I, as someone who had reading problems, I, I sure do appreciate the, uh, the presentation on the sabbatical and, and the learning and reading strategies that were presented. And, um, you know, in, in all of uh, Trustee Smith Everett's uh, work and leadership, the answering of the Juneteenth question I sure do appreciate your intelligence, grace, and dignity, which you uh, have brought to this board. So thank you. Dr. Sobchak. The program we have with Blue Valley is a big deal. I mean, it's incredibly uh, gratifying when you go to a Blue Valley Board of Education meeting and you hear them talk in glowing uh, terms about the college. Uh, Dr. McLeod and I uh, attended one of those meetings in which we were honored. I have to say, um, uh, Dr. McLeod was more like the rock star there as he was swarmed by his by his fans and I had to you know find my own seat type of deal. Um, but Dr. McLeod, I know the Blue Valley program is just kind of a first step. What's your vision for working with K through 12 in this regard? Ultimately, the, the goal for these programs is that we will work with K through 12 across our service area so that we can provide um, what I'm going to call without a real name uh, an academy concept. Um, whereby high achieving students and students who are prepared for college opportunities um, can come to Johnson County directly to work with our faculty in our classrooms, utilizing all of the equipment, technology, and opportunities that we can provide uh, to move them forward. My hope is that we can build a pipeline of students who can achieve both uh, a high school diploma and an AA simultaneously. Um, this is work that I was a part of over in Missouri that is new a newer concept to the state of Kansas that, that I would like to see us be able to implement kind of in full uh, and being able to provide more opportunities for those students, particularly as we have entered um, a stage of education where because of our um, accreditation and national and regional accreditation standards, many of the high schools have had a difficult time employing instructors uh, who meet uh, appropriate qualification standards to be able to teach college material. The more opportunities that we have to bring those students here to work with our faculty who have all of those um, accolades and the ability to, to offer them a, a stronger education than we would be able to do at a distance. Um, I think that it will strengthen our service area and in the long run be a model for other service areas across the state of Kansas to be able to work with their K-12s. Any other districts have any interest? Right now, uh, we have four districts that, that are quite interested. Uh, Shawnee Mission is interested in working with us. Olathe is interested in working with us. Um, and in the coming year, we will actually uh, be working uh, with Eudora, uh, who is looking to begin sending some students to us this coming academic year, provided we can find a way to make our way through all of the kind of niceness that COVID-19 has, has put in our path. Um, and so we will be able to continue growing this uh, as a programmatic approach uh, with the hope that we can serve more students in our, uh, in our service area and, and that we can kind of open up a little bit more of what we have to offer directly on the campus, not simply through our dual credit college now opportunities. Anything else on learning quality, Trustee Cook? That concludes our report. Questions? Move on to the management committee report, Trustee Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chair, the management uh, report. Mr. Is Chair, valid. I make a motion that Trustee Snyder recruits himself out of the room while we discuss the management committee as per our trustee ethics policy of 1114.02 on paragraph number three. He brought forward and worked on environmental policy at JCC and management committee while working as a paid lobbyist. He did not disclose that in that committee. He, has been, he is being paid by NRDC, which is an environmental lobby group. This is 
a clear conflict of interest. While I agree with the environmental policies, the public has a right to know that this represents his paid work as well as his elected work, and the end does not justify the means. So I would be more comfortable to have Trustee Snyder recuse himself as per our ethic policy, uh, the code of ethic policy. Which I, the management committee, are you referring to? We only have one management committee. Well, we have topics. I, I'm not speaking to any of the substance of your comments because I don't know anything about it. It has never been brought up before to me. But are you suggesting a trustee needs to recuse himself or herself with respect to the retention of the official newspaper? Mr. Chair, I think the entire management committee, uh, he is a paid lobbyist. I think that uh, I have concerns and regarding the conflicts of interest and voting on any building efforts, considering his listing with the Secretary of State as lobbyist for developers. Uh, he spoke to me today about his active recruiting of developers and construction companies. And I think uh, it is hard to know uh, just where and how much of the conflicts of interest. And I think for peace of mind during the committee report to have him recuse himself. And I think that um, solves the issue of any conflicts of interest as stated in our ethics, uh, code of ethics uh, states that rest, uh, restraint of participation, um, uh, trustees uh, should not be uh, doing all of these acts. They should not be participating in related board discussions, making recommendations, negotiating terms or uh, contractual provisions uh, and voting on them. So. Um, I, I don't see anything on the management committee agenda that in any way affects Trustee Snyder's independence, either perceived or real, with respect to what you've just described. I don't know the process for forcing a recusal under Kansas law that is up to each individual uh, elected official is my understanding. Um, is there a second to the motion that would exclude Trustee Snyder from any participation in any management committee matters? If not, let's move on to the retention of official newspaper, please. Well, the management report again is on pages 17 to 33. Before we get to the recommendations and the motions, I would just say that uh, uh, Trustee Smith Everett, Trustee Snyder and I were in attendance with, again, a plethora of faculty and staff. Uh, Randy Weber, uh, interim executive vice president, uh, presented information on two agreements of which we've discussed previously. Those agreements are found on page 53 and 55, deal with the Blue Valley School District for Career Ready Partnership and JCCC's in-kind contribution space for workforce activities. Rachel Lears, Associate Vice President of Financial Services, provided a report on the 2020-2021 budget development. She reminded us that the July 2020 Board of Trustees meeting, the board votes to approve and publish a one-page portion of the legal budget and the notice of public hearing. Public hearing will be held in August and when we approve the 2021 legal budget. Uh, next, Ms. Lears gave a presentation of estimated actual results compared to budget for the fiscal year ending on June 30, 2020, uh, the, including preliminary estimates of underspending and certain operating budget lines due to the campus uh, closure. Uh, that was a follow-up to a detailed report she gave in May and uh, an ongoing update of, of what our status is from month to month. Janelle Vogler, Associate Vice President of Business Services, presented the single source purchase report that's found on page 23 and the contract renewal report, which can be found on page 24. Tom Hall, Associate Vice President of Campus Services, gave the monthly update on capital infrastructure projects. That report is found on page 28. He also reported on current progress of the construction projects on campus, then reviewed the report of the financial status of facilities master plan projects and that report is found on page 29. Uh, we have a number of recommendations. The first is the official newspaper. Uh, Chris Gray, Associate Vice President, Strategic Communications and Marketing stated that Kansas statute requires that when a school district or community college is published as a legal notice in a newspaper, a newspaper must be one that is published at least weekly, 50 times a year in the college's district. Therefore, it is the recommendation of the management committee that the board of trustees accepts the recommendation of the college administration to designate the legal record in the Gardner, Gardner News as official newspapers of the college and that publication constitutes legal notice on behalf of the board of trustees and I'll make that motion. Second. 
I'd like to make a substitute motion to All offer right. this actually to the KC Star and the Shawnee Mission Post. The legal record is a paid subscription, which automatically limits the amount of people that can see our press releases and public notices and the Gardner News. Uh, as far as the reach for, that the KC Star and the Shawnee Mission Post have, I'm not understanding why uh, we don't have this anyway. So I'm making a substitute motion to actually offer this to KC Star and Shawnee Mission Post. We went through this last month and I'll just say, I'm gonna accept your motion as a motion to amend as opposed to a motion to substitute. I will state and, and Mr. Gray and Ms. Nazar can correct me if I'm wrong. The paper has to be published in Kansas. It cannot be published. The Kansas City Star does not publish in Kansas. It has to be a published print newspaper. The Shawnee Mission Post is not a published print newspaper. We are constrained by Kansas law we have been part of an effort over the years to be able to simply publish our legal notices on our website because it would save considerable funds. Uh, but the Kansas Press Association in, in Topeka is a very powerful lobby and that has not gotten anywhere. So we have choices of basically these two newspapers published in Johnson County with a sufficient uh, circulation to allow us to legally choose them. Uh, would you like to withdraw your amendment? Uh, I'd like to make an amendment to that uh, motion to uh, change the KC Star to the pitch. The pitch is published in Kansas City, Missouri as well, best of my knowledge. Do we have clarification on that? Well, I think it would be a mistake to pick a paper tonight that for the first time we've heard about your selection of the pitch or the Kansas City Star and assume it's a Kansas paper. Um, so is your amendment now to kick out one of these Johnson County published newspapers and add the pitch as the sole newspaper or as one of the two? Uh, Mr. Chair, we're allowed to make amendments. So that's something that we can do right now. And the pitch does print in the Johnson County area actually in Wyandotte. Uh, so that is something that is within the Kansas limit. Is there a second? Well, I'm, I'm trying to clarify your motion for the board. What is your amendment now? My amendment is to offer a uh, these, I'm sorry, the uh, to the pitch uh, and to the Shawnee Mission Post. Um, the Shawnee Mission Post does not qualify as a print newspaper. I, I'm uh, sorry that I didn't hear that. Why? Because it must be a printed newspaper published in Kansas. Print, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, how about the Gardner News then? So the, the amendment would actually be to the pitch and the Garden News, Gardner News. I've already seconded. I, I seconded the motion. My dad was born in Gardner. Well, did you second the motion to amend? I did when she wanted the post and the no. pitch. I, my, my mistake. Okay, I so track I did not hear you. Okay, we have a motion by Trustee Lawson and a second by Trustee Snyder to amend Us? the recommendation to include the pitch and the Kansas City Star as our, our as our newspaper, what? Shawnee Mission Post and the Kansas City Star as our legal newspapers. Is there discussion? Mr. Chair, I just wanna make sure my correct amendment because what you're saying doesn't match what I said. So I'm making a substitute motion to amend that it goes to the pitch and the Gardner News. I understand, but okay. I didn't realize your first amended attempt had been seconded, which means it is on the floor and that is what we will vote on. Your first amendment was to uh, recommend the Kansas City Star and the Shawnee Mission Post, neither of which meet the statutory requirements. Is there any further discussion? All in favor of the amendment, please signify by saying aye. Are you, are you in favor of your amendment, Trustee Lawson? Uh, sorry, it's hard to hear. There's a lot of echoes, so I'm just trying to follow the amendment here. Uh, do you need me to withdraw this amendment to go to the one that I was talking about? Uh, you may, you, you made the motion. If you'd like to withdraw the motion, um, I will accept that and you can make a substitute amendment. 
Oh, okay, so I'd like to withdraw the amendment to offer this to the Casey Star and Shawnee Mission Post. Instead, I'd like to make the substitute motion to amend to offer it to the Pitch and uh, the Gardner News. I'd like to object, Mr. Chair. I mean, the Pitch and uh, Vice President McLeod and I just looked it up. The Pitch is in Missouri. So I'm going to. Wind up. I don't know what to say. It, right it's now. where it's printed. It's not where it's distributed. Um, do you want to? You want to vote on your motion? I, we don't have a second. The motion to amend to make it the pitch in the Gardner News dies for lack of a second. I'd like to call the original question, please. Second. The question has been called on the original motion. We designate the Gardner News and the legal record of the official newspapers of the college. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries six to one with Trustee Lawson voting in opposition. Next item. Mr. Trustee Gray Cook. also reported that each year the college sponsors selected events that help the college maintain strong community relationships. <clears throat> the organizations are listed on page 18 of the board packet. This is always a difficult a decision to make as we get several requests. It is vetted uh, uh, by a number of people at the college and therefore it is the recommendation of the management committee that the board accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the above list of sponsorships, <clears throat> excuse me, for the 2020-2021 fiscal year at a cost of $15,000 plus an additional 2,000 contingency for a total cost of $17,000 and I'll make that motion. Second. Moved by Trustee Cook and seconded by Trustee Cross to approve the sponsorships listed on page 18 of the board packet. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. That motion carries unanimously. Next item, uh, Randy Weber presented a draft of the 2021 Management Committee Working Agenda found on pages 20 and 21 of your packet. It is a recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees approve the fiscal year 2020-2021 Management Committee Working Agenda, and I'll make that motion. Second. Moved by Trustee Cook, seconded by Trustee Smith Everett to approve the Working Agenda for the Management Committee for uh, fiscal year 2020-21. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Yes. Opposed, nay. Next item, we have one single uh, the source purchase. carries to, unanimously. I just need to make sure I do that for the minutes. We have one single source purchase to present uh, for recommendations. It is the Micro Data Systems, Inc. for continuing education for trainers uh, and curriculum. It is a recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the single source justification for the fiscal 21 estimated amount for micro data systems for a total estimated amount of $210,000 and I'll make that motion. Second. Moved by Trustee Cook, seconded by Trustee Smith Everett to approve the recommendation for the sole source award uh, to micro data systems. Is there discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. That motion carries unanimously. Ms. Vogel reported that there was one recommendation based on requests for proposals. This recommendation is for RFP for network infrastructure equipment and services. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the board of trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the proposal from serious computer solutions for the provisions of various network infrastructure products and software subscriptions for an estimated base year of $1,065,878 for fiscal year 2020-21 and a total expenditure estimated of $5,329,392 for the optional renewals through 2025. And I'll make that motion. Second. Moved by Trustee Cook, seconded by Trustee Cross to approve the uh, selection of serious computer solution for provision of various network uh, infrastructure products and software subscription. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries unanimously. The final recommendation has to do with extending our lease at the West Park Center on 87th Street in Overland Park. The 
College occupies space for the cosmetology and ABE, GED, ESL programs, credit and non-credit classes. Mr. Hall reported that the existing fifth lease amendment agreement executed in August 1, 2015 will expire on July 31, 2020. The sixth lease amendment will renew the existing five lease agreement for a three-year term from August 1, 2020 through July 31, 2023, with three additional one-year options. The college will have the option to terminate the lease without penalty once per year during the three-year renewal period. Therefore, it is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the administration's recommendation to exercise the three-year lease extension with three additional one-year options for the West Park Center leases per agreement subject to review by legal counsel, and I'll make that motion. Second. Moved by Trustee Cook, seconded by Trustee Cross to approve the lease as presented uh, with West Park Center. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a substitute motion that we actually uh, refer this back to uh, committee because there has been uh, numerous complaints about this location and this site and we need to be able to take better care of the students and professors that are coming off site. There's been a number of complaints that I've personally heard over the years that there's a struggle between being able to complete the two-year program because the off-site does not allow for the travel time to make back-to-back -back classes, so they miss out and they act have to end up extending their amount of time to finish their degree. I think there's not enough oversight uh, when you don't have the cross-pollination on main campus. And I believe in Dr. McLeod's team that there is an option to be able to really advance this instead of asking one more year, one more year, one more year. I think the feedback that is coming back from faculty and staff uh, and students are important and I think I'd like to uh, make a motion to refer this to either to management committee to make a task force to get this done with uh, the new president and I think that's possible instead of renewing another year. Could you please state then exactly what your amendment proposes? Uh, my amendment is to refer this back to management committee for Dr. McLeod to put together a task force to find another site. Dr. McLeod, it appears as though we need to renew the lease by August 1 of 2020. Is that correct? That is correct at this time. And that in each of the three years of the base term, we would have the option to terminate the lease? Uh, currently, the base allows us to terminate um, with some minor penalty. Uh, we can, uh, I mean, we can talk about that, but yes, we do have the option to um, we pull ourselves out during that three years and then each individual year of uh, renewal on the on the other end of four, five, and six could also be pulled. I, I might point out this is a unique uh, contract for us and that is three years with uh, three one-year options at the end. Historically, we've done five-year. When Dr. McLeod and I spoke about this uh, and working with our facilities folks, we don't believe that we would be able to do anything on campus any earlier than three years, which is why the initial three years is uh, what is requested as part of the lease agreement. Okay, is there a second to the amendment to refer this back to management committee? I presume at their July meeting to then be acted on at our July meeting, at which time a negotiated lease would have to be made with the landlord. Mr. Chair, just to clarify, this is the recommendation of the administration and Dr. McLeod, not the amendment, amended motion, but the recommendation we're prepared to vote on is what the administration has in its due diligence recommended. Correct. And was Correct. recommended by the management committee. Yeah. Okay. As, as well as I'd like to say, continuing ed, we run a very large program over there for ESL students. So this would, this would have a huge impact on us as well. What is ESL? Our English second language program. Okay. I, I would also like to speak and say I would be on the other end of it arguing for it to remain where it is because it's a really vital location for the community that accesses it for the adult basic education and for the ESL where that particular area is a very large area that um, has people who speak another language and so it's convenient for them. So and transportation issues is a very big deal. 
it's walkable. Concern for us. I concur. Let's let's get. I, I, is there a uh, Dr. Second? McLeod, can you please speak on the reason for some of the research that you explained to me about the feedback of the students and faculty? And I also know directly from the students and the professors there, uh, as I have attended and had services there to understand that offsite program, a lot of those uh, populations that go there are not current trends, and so they miss out on the opportunities to do hair for current uh, younger generations, and we would get that opportunity if they were on site, and they don't have that opportunity, and so there's a lot of students that have uh, expressed concerns that they are going and getting hired into salons that then they have not had the proper practice because what's in the current salons are not uh, that that are coming in and so the movement on campus would be something that I think our team and I believe in Dr. McLeod I believe in the ability to uh, find what needs to get done and he's been a great advocate to do that and if Dr. McLeod you can speak on some of the research and the program reviews and uh, that have you have talked about. Dr. I, th McLeod, I think go ahead and finish and make your remarks and then I'm going to ask if there's a second to the, to the amendment. Yeah, I, I think that you've, uh, I think the trustee Lawson has spoken to the issues the program is, is dealing with right now and we are looking at the future of what we need to do with this program in terms of whether that would be retrofitting here on campus, um, possible solutions of, of new facilities um, being, being prepared. Uh, and, and I think that what she has elaborated uh, pretty thoroughly covers uh, a number of the issues, both with the retrofitting of that facility that has been done, um, which has been a little bit problematic, and we have had to do a great deal of upkeep um, to maintain um, viable standards for those students, but also because of the, the viability of other populations um, utilizing those services and providing better clinical opportunities for those students. I think that's all accurate. It is all part of our evaluation and part of what we're working towards in the future. And, and I believe we need to trust in our Is there a second to that amendment, Mr. Chair? There's not yet. Trustee Lawson appears to be frozen on the screen, so I'm going to give her a chance to unfreeze. Then I will ask if there's a second. Angelina, can you hear me? Any idea which end this is on? Yeah, I'm trying to find out if they're still going. Uh, Did we not buy the unlimited Zoom? Well, she's gone, so okay. yeah, she's disconnected. So she's um, no longer in the meeting. Okay. Well, I, I'm going to propose we text her. We give her a minute. While you're doing that, Mr. Chair, I just want to support what um, Laura Smith Everett talked about in our management committee. We did spend considerable time talking about the, um, the positives for the ESL program and the other programs we have there, even GED. So uh, we spent a lot of time reinforcing that that was a good location for those. Now, if we've got some program issues with cosmetolo cosmetology, then I, those certainly need to be dealt with. And I, I just wanted to clarify, we can decouple those, right? There's no particular reason the location needs to hold both. Yeah, we can decouple the programs. At this point, they share the building. We, we split the building in half with them at this point. I remember having to stop my ESL students from going towards the cosmetology wing, and it's a very open corridor. So I understand the, truly understand. Trustee that. Lawson is logging back in. She indicates she's 
Ian, you see her, Jason? She says she sees me, which is probably a good sign of some, some something. There have been all sorts of Zoom issues tonight, too, on different computers. Okay. We're seeing different things, so it's kind of been a weird night. Okay, I think. Thank you, Jason, for switching me over. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Well, I, I know she Lawson said she could hear me, but I don't know if she's talking about my phone or my microphone. Microphone and can you hear me now? Trustee Lawson, can you hear me? I can. Can you speak up? Right here. Okay. We have no video. We have your sound very faint. Uh, so when, when you're speaking, you'll need to speak up extra loud. Okay. Okay. Um, is, is there, there a, a second? second? Is there a second to the amendment that would refer this lease agreement back to the management committee for further consideration? For Dr. McLeod to have a task force to address this. For Dr. McLeod to have a task force to address this. For Dr. McLeod to have a task force to address this. For Dr. McLeod to have a task force. Right. I heard you say Dr. McLeod to have a task force. Right. Um, that motion McLeod dies for lack of a second. Motion dies for lack of a second. So we're back to the main motion to approve the lease. The lease has been moved and seconded. All in favor of approving the recommendation to, to enter the new lease for the West Park Center as presented, signify by saying aye. 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 Yes. yes. Those opposed say nay. Nay. That vote is six to one with Trustee Lawson voting nay. That concludes our report. I would defer to Trustees Snyder and Smith Everett if they have additional things to say. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to the ad hoc committees. The first report will be from the presidential transition team, Trustee Cook and Trustee Smith Everett. I would just say that because I've been speaking so much here lately, uh, we've, we've uh, Trustee Smith Everett and I have been leading a team to properly uh, say goodbye to our current president and to welcome the new one. And uh, Laura, if you want to take the lead on that, tell us what's going on. Sure, we've been sure have the microphone close. We have been uh, keeping the trustees updated with a weekly uh, email that you should be receiving from us um, to review just this week's um, items that we've been working on. We've been working on the details for this June meeting for the song and dance. We have prepared a Cirque du Soleil type ceremony at the end for Dr. Sobchak's very last board meeting. Just making sure you're paying attention. Dr. Sobchak. Yeah, well, it just, just you wait. So we've been working on the, uh, the plans for all of that. And then we are also working uh, with Dr. Bound to get his plans in place so that um, we can have him come on board and have the public and the internal and external communities um, know his vision and his, his plan. He has a 90 day plan for how he'd like to uh, meet all the different stakeholders that are important in this job. and. Um, the uh, marketing team is working on a website that will be um, brought live when Dr. Bound comes on board. And so we've been working on those details. And then uh, finally, we've been working with um, Chairman Musil to um, very lightly map out an understanding that your um, goal was to have two retreats. And he, uh, the Chairman's been working with us to um, work on the details where an August retreat is really just for the sole purpose of the COVID, uh, the reopening and for all of the trustees. July. And doc oh, did, what did I say? You said August. But I mean, July, sorry. Um, July retreat is just for that sole purpose, but then we will also have an August retreat. And I know I, one of the feedback that I received from one trustee is uh, several internal um, 
board policies and procedures that they, that that individual would like implemented and so we will have a broader discussion about uh, board and president protocols and procedures at an August um, retreat yet to be planned is that correct a good summary that's okay. that's the plan and that is all I have I, I would say that in addition uh, in, in response to Dr. Liker's remarks uh, about uh, inclusion I think we all understand the challenge uh, of dealing with these unprecedented times and the anxiety we have and apprehension, not just with a new leader uh, and, and, and how the college will move forward, but dealing with the COVID crisis, dealing with uh, the social racial unrest that's occurred in the last several weeks. Uh, so we, we know there's anxiety and, and uh, what we've tried to do with our plan. And by the way, we uh, have sent that to all of the trustees. We've communicated with the trustees personally for uh, edits. We've included those edits. I think, I think we're really at a point now with the plan and it, it includes about 12, uh, 12 points. I would just like to share for the public uh, the, the first couple of, of paragraphs the primary purpose of this plan is to purposefully facilitate a clear, collaborative, and inclusive transition process for Dr. Andy Bound, Johnson County Community College, and the community in which it serves. Strategies will focus upon creating an open line of communication with all stakeholders, hopefully we can deliver on that, ensuring transparency and open communication during the entire transition process, building a trustworthy communication process, apprising the Board of Trustees via weekly updates on the transition progress, uh, and Laura Smith Everett's done a great job with that. Uh, trustees role in the transition, and we have a number of points here to deal with this board becoming a high performing board uh, by focus upon, focusing upon the college's destination, CEO's performance, assessing individual uh, board performance as to how such aligns with and supports the affirmation points, affirmation points. Scheduling board retreats that Laura has referred to, clear understanding of the president's 90 day plan and understanding of how a smooth transition will benefit the college. And in addition to that is to properly say goodbye to, to, to Dr. Sopcic, which we will do later this evening. So, uh, and, and then I think the, the 12th point that was added uh, as a result of our discussions with you is the full board in consultation with Dr. Bond will conduct a review of the transitional plan progress during the fall semester. So this just isn't a goodbye Joe, uh, tonight in June, and hello to Dr. Bowen on the first week of July and put it away, we intend to use this plan as kind of a framework uh, to, to, if we're really serious about becoming a high-performing board, uh, to move this college forward, that we'll take those, those actions seriously. So I want to thank all of you for your input uh, into the plan. We all have a responsibility to uh, benefit the students of this campus with the very best teaching and learning experience that we can provide. And in a time when safety and health and, and emotional uh, disturbances are really impacting all of us as students and faculty. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Laura, for your work. Questions of the presidential transition team? Trustee Lawson, we still cannot see you, so you're gonna have to uh, shout out out any questions. I do not. Thank you. Uh, next item is the ad hoc uh, committee on board self-assessment. That's trustees Cross and trustee Ingram. Yes, thank you, trustee Ingram. Uh, trustee Ingram asked me to speak on this tonight. And I'm happy to do so, although she has carried most of the water on the committee. I've, I've been a stay at home dad really for the last three months. So uh, I thank her for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I will note that we have been working with Colleen Allen at ACC2, you to my knowledge, is the Director of Educational Services there. We have worked with her discussing uh, ways and opportunities that we might have to adopt some of the standards that they use at the national level and within our, our industry. So we are meeting with her Monday yes. at uh, 8, 8 Eastern, 7 a.m. Uh, via Zoom. Yes. Uh, Trustee Ingram, at all hours of the day, thankfully accommodating my schedules, I've also been running a, a law practice. Uh, I appreciate uh, Trustee Ingram's leadership on this and everything she does. And uh, Mr. Chair, we'll meet Monday with ACCT to go over that. We're hoping to do 
perhaps something of a hybrid. ACCT has a number of different uh, templates and, and models that we could use for self-assessment. Although I will mention uh, trustee uh, Dr. Cook uh, set up a, a couple of templates that uh, we plan to use a year or two ago uh, and that we had used in the past. So we're hoping to save some money for the college, but also consult with ACCT as to what would be the best way forward. And I would ask Trustee Ingram if she has anything to add, but that concludes my report. No, I think you did a great job. We're looking forward to that conversation. It's just scheduling issues that we've had and, and Monday morning at seven is it. So we'll report back next month. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody that wants to join, please get in touch with one of those two trustees. Seven a.m. Monday. Um, all right, thank you for that. Uh, we're now ready for the president's, president's recommendations for action. We're right back to you, Trustee Cross, for the treasurer's report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, treasurer's report uh, can be found in your board packet, and uh, it is for the month ended, I believe, April 30th, 2020. And some items of note include that page one of the report is the general post secondary technical education fund summary. April was the 10th month of the college's 2019-2020 uh, fiscal year. Uh, the college's unencumbered cash balance as of April 30th, 2020 in all funds was $93.4 million, which is approximately uh, $2.2 million lower than at the same time last year. Expenditures in the primary operating funds are within the approved budgetary limits. And, and I will note the, uh, uh, the wisdom of this administration, this board has been to, um, we increased the mill. One of the first votes I held in 2013, uh, participated in was to raise the mill. Uh, uh, president Sobchak, a brand new president made that courageous decision to do it. And we built up our reserves. Um, this is an incredibly uncertain time, but I think the leadership of this administration and this board uh, has put us in a decent position to help put people back to work as we have record people unemployed. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chair, it is the recommendation of the college administration that the Board of Trustees approve the Treasurer's Report for the month ended uh, April 30th, 2020, subject to audit. And I'd make that motion. It's been moved by Trustee Cross and seconded by Trustee Snyder to approve the Treasurer's Report uh, subject to audit. Is there any discussion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Trustee Lawson, do I hear you? Yes. Okay, you'll really need to speak up, please. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, sorry. I just had a question on page 35 to 42. When I calculated up all the ending balances of unencumbered cash, that total was 103 million, and then add the 112 million that is tied up in investments on page 43, the total unencumbered cash that I have is 215 million, is it correct? No, that's not correct. The unencumbered cash includes investments and other numbers. I think Rachel Lears is on the Zoom if she wants to address that. The unencumbered cash in the basic operating account, post-secondary technical ed is 80 million. I would recall it was 110 million at the end of January. It goes down until we get our ad valorem tax payments in this month that would be reflected in the June 30th financial statements. Uh, Mr. Chair, actually then on page 37, the unencumbered cash for adult supplementary education fund is a little over a million. The student activity fund is 727. Then on page 38, there's more calculations of unencumbered cash as well as page 39, 41, and 42, and the number of that comes up to 103 million. And those are specific funds, some of which are self-supporting, and which can only be used for those particular topics. They fluctuate during the year, and I think what our policy reflects is the balance in the general post-secondary educational funds, and that's what our policy is based on. Um, there are on occasion balances in other funds that are unencumbered. Uh, That's fine, Mr. Chair. What I was asking that unencumbered cash. I'm just asking for the total number of unencumbered cash because on page 44, it also shows that the graph meets that $103 million mark on the line for fiscal uh, year 2019. 
And even though the unencumbered balance on that line, uh, the chart does not show the 11 million, but the graph does show 103, so not 80. Well, I would, uh, I, I'm not sure if you have a question or a point. Uh, my question that I said, uh, Mr. Chair, was the current amount, was it 103? And plus the 112 million in investments that are going to be mature at the end of July show 112. So that's 215 million in our reserves. I wanted to know if that was true. Dr. Weber, can, can you clarify that the investment numbers are not added to unencumbered cash? We have confidence in the chart that's on page 44 as being reflective of the unencumbered cash on hand. Um, I, as far as speaking to the, the fund strategies and the investment pool, I would defer to Rachel Lears on that though. Okay, so that is a graph that shows 103 million for fiscal year 19. In the general fund, that is correct. Thank you, that was my question. Mr. Chair. Uh, on page 36, I had a question for the amounts that were paid. It says, faculty continuing ed program dropped by 24% during COVID. And I wanted to know why the natural gas was 138% in April. Was that due to usage or rates? I'm sorry, we couldn't hear you. Was that due to usage or what was your second word? On page 36, it shows that the faculty continuing ed program dropped by 24% during COVID. The other question, why was the natural gas 138 higher in April during COVID? Was that due to usage or rates? I don't know if anybody can answer those specific questions at the board meeting. Uh, We'd be happy to follow up uh, with with subject matter experts to to, the, to that question. Um, I can say overall utility usage was down immensely during during the uh, last couple of months, but I, I can't answer that question specifically okay. now. If we get an email, we'd be happy to answer it. Okay, because it might be the rates. That's fine. And then on the last page, forty three, it shows our interest rates for capital federal was a quarter interest rate for four million for seventy seven days. Yet a regular savings account is point five for any amount over two hundred thousand. And Bank of KC is giving four interest rate on seven million. For 91, 91 days, days when a regular, regular savings, savings account, account is five, five for three months CD. CD. Do we have a reason as to why we are getting a lower rate than if we just walked in the door? If you'll notice, those individual investments are made at various times to a variety of banks for both safety and security purposes and to spread those based on the market rate at the time. So they're going to vary. And at some times, we probably take advantage of a higher rate. And sometimes it's a lower rate. I'm sure that uh, Ms. Dr. Weber or Ms. Lears would follow up with you on that, along with our investor advisors. Is that going to require a board vote to make changes to this so that we get actually a better rate than what is being given to us? Well, it, it would require a change in policy if this board is going to get into the investment policies uh, on short term or long time, long term basis. Uh, which we have delegated to the president of the financial office. So that would require a policy change. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to understand that. Thank you. Um, all in favor of adoption of the treasurer's report signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. I believe that vote was unanimous. Uh, we will move on now to the advisory committees. Uh, Dr. Sopcic. Thank you, Trustee Musil. It's always my pleasure to make my one loan recommendation of the year, and this is it. Um, it's about advisory committees, and advisory committees are very important here at our college. Um, I couldn't tell you the exact number that we have, um, but Mickey, I'm going to give you a chance to talk here um, after I read this recommendation as a part of the discussion. Um, but I will tell you that they're essential to the curriculum taught in many of our courses. Before we built the Libby uh, Current Tech Building, um, those 
those advisory committees were coming in early on Saturday mornings and spending a, a good portion of the day uh, talking to our faculty and trying to make sure that what we were teaching in that building was uh, the most current and relevant uh, type of, of, of stuff to ensure that those students would be able to get a great job when they finished. And I, so I know there's a real commitment here. Um, the list has been distributed to everyone. Um, you're, you should be reasonably familiar with it. I'd like to read the recommendation. Um, it's the recommendation of the college administration that the board of trustees approve the advisory committees contained in supplement B from July 1st, 2020 through June 30, 2021. I'd like to have the opportunity for some discussion on this. First, is there, is there such a motion? So a trustee, so, so moved. Moved Second. by Trustee Cross. Second. Seconded by Trustee Ingram. We're ready for discussion. Proceed, Dr. Sopcich. Uh, Dr. McLeod, could you, um, I'm glad to see you removed your Iowa State mask. Um, here, here. Could you perhaps provide a little enlightenment on the list this year? Yes, there, there was an error in this year's list um, due to a miscommunication b between a couple of the administrative professionals who actually work on that list. What was provided for you was supposed to have been redacted for personal information because a couple of years ago we had an error um, in my first year where we had people's personal cell phone numbers listed in the public document. Um, and so it is supposed to have listed not contact information, but the individual, their role and the, and the uh, place of business that, that we reached out to to have professionals sent to our uh, and what happened was they thought that they needed to redact everything except the individual and their role. And so what you have is, is a little in air. And so we will be correcting that and getting um, the appropriate information, which should include the business that the individual represents as well um, onto that list and getting those back out. Any questions? Further discussion? Trustee Smith Everett. So uh, I wanted to talk about the Police Academy Advisory Committee on page 42. Um, one of the things that struck me about it is it's the only advisory committee, and I, I will be honest that I did not read every single advisory committee, but I did a pretty good scan of them that didn't have a diverse group represented on it. Every single member of the Regional Police Academy Advisory Committee are chiefs. And I wondered if there was any consideration to push back with other diverse um, members who could offer maybe a different perspective than a chief of police for a police academy. While I understand part of the purpose is, of course, making sure they're meeting their obligations, in light of things that are happening nationally, I feel like this is a good opportunity to think more broadly about how we prepare our, um, our cadets for um, service. Yeah, that's a very good perspective, and thanks for, for raising that issue. You know, the Police Academy uh, serves uh, local mun mis municipalities in Johnson County. Um, we're very honored to have that here on our campus. Um, it's, it's a great opportunity, obviously, for, uh, for the county to, to come on campus and feel, part, feel a part of our community. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. McLeod to provide a little bit more insight into how that works. Um, if you look at particularly our um, police, fire, um, and EMS, uh, there are both statutory reasons, um, but also because of earlier statutes, when those were created, those are populated primarily by chiefs. Now, those are the listed members. Those are not necessarily always the people who attend because each chief has the right to send um, a, a representative. Now, in terms of the police, the police chiefs actually do usually attend. The fire chiefs will occasionally send sub chiefs. So we end up with that listing of the individuals who um, have been designated that we know will be coming. Um, so some of those are placeholders in that we are, each one of the served, particularly police academy, each one of the served police academies has to have a representative from the chief's office as the individual. Um, that we have now in, in, in terms of the possibility of expansion, those are still opportunities that are available beyond those folks. I, that would be my request. I, just looking at the, for example, the Emergency Medical Service Advisory Committee by comparison is 
much is much broader mm -hmm. in terms of you've got physicians, you have government officials, you have the fire department represented. And so you really get a sense that you've got a lot of people from different points of view, but also it has many more members than the uh, police academy one, which seems to be one of the smaller ones. So I, I would request or advocate for uh, a more diverse uh, representation on that. Um, and I think that's a really important thing for us as uh, the host of the local police academy. And if, if I can add, I mean, certainly what's, what has happened has been horrific. And hopefully we, we should all have hope that from these tragedies, um, something positive and constructive can happen that will help hopefully help avert them in the future. And I think what you're talking about is on that path. Thank you, appreciate that. Thank you, Trustee Smith Everett. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. As, as do I. The other thing that I wanted to just add on that last sentence, that committees can also be integral to fundraising and job placement. I think they're friend raising as well. And I think that's just another piece of it. These, some folks may not do the fundraising, but some of them may go out and speak in the community too. So they're extremely valuable. Thank you. Mr. Snyder. Uh, Dr. Snyder. So this is motion is termed and we're approving these advisory committees. If someone were to leave a committee, can they not be in that slot on the field without us voting on it? I think I think not. I mean, these committees. My understanding, Mickey, you're going to yeah, contradict me. On yeah, that? I, I can speak to that. These committees are actually on what you get when we approve these each year is a simple snapshot in time. We are always adding um, and reducing Good. the numbers and the individuals on these committees in perpetuity, um, as as different companies, particularly when we have small businesses represented, when people shut down, uh, they rotate off. Uh, occasionally when a new business opens in the area, we will invite those individuals and see if we can get someone to join us. If there are emerging technologies or new fields that are a part of a, a connected subfield, we try to bring those folks in. So this is always a moving target. What, what is approved here yearly is a simple snapshot in time um, that can be larger, smaller, shifting within days um, based on change within the community and what is happening within each one of those major areas. Okay, thank you. Uh, with, with that in mind, I guess I would just encourage you and Karen and everyone else that's particularly involved just to make sure, um, you know, with, with the issues of the day, to make sure that we're inclusive on, on all these. Um, I know you've gone through a lot of work, you know, up to this point, but maybe just look at it with a different lens that we all have you know, at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, if Mr. Chair, no further discussion. All in favor? Mr. Chair, I we have a motion and a second. Mr. Chair, uh, all in favor say aye. Mr. Chair, I'm aye. Hello, Mr. Chair. Opposed nay. Mr. Chair, yes, hello, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. yes. hello, Trustee Lawson. I'm trying, I'm trying to talk. talk. I would like, I would like to like, thank you so much to Dr. McLeod, Dr. McLeod for responding to my email about this. I really appreciate the uh, feedback to be able to make changes to that. I think it's very important to make sure that we are transparent with the public as to which businesses are in advisory positions that help craft curriculum, help navigate and steer our college specific direction. And we need to make sure not to stack advisory committees with a single company. And I believe also the diversity of ownership that needs to be represented in these committees. So I thank you so much, Dr. McLeod, for uh, responding and to make these changes. Yes, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. okay. I, I, I gather you voted. voted. Yes. 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 yes, Trustee Lawson. Yes. 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 Okay, uh, that, that vote, vote was vote unanimous. unanimous. Yes. Uh, the next the item on the agenda, agenda is the monthly report, report to the board. board. I'm going to alert, alert the board, the board if, anybody if anybody would like a break, break after, after this. this. Um, we'll take a very short break. I hate to do that when we're on Zoom, but I think we've been going for two and a half hours. So. Um, after the president's monthly report to the board, we'll take a very short break right before new business. Dr. Sopcich. Thank you. What if I told you I was going to take 25 minutes? Would you want to have a break early? <laughs> I might leave. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Trustee Musil. I won't take 25, possibly 20. Um, first of all,
Uh, if you're serious about 20, we should take a break now. No, I don't know. Once I get going, I just don't know if I can. Well, I didn't know manage, if you had a lightning uh, round or. Oh, no. You well, you know, you might want to take that break now. That'd why be a good idea. Why don't we take a break now? For those who are watching on Zoom, I have 746. Let's try to be back here by 750. I know that's not very much time, but as close to 750 as you can. And when we get everybody back, we will start over. Uh, Trustee Lawson, did you hear that? Yes, Mr. Yes, Chair. 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 Okay, I will uh, ask you if you're present when we get back. Thank you. Uh, Greg Musil, Chair of the Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees. We took about a five minute break there, six, eight minute break for the first time since we started the meeting at five o'clock. I apologize for the interruption for those of you who are watching on Zoom. Maybe it offers you an opportunity for a break as well. Um, we're ready now for the President's monthly report to the board, Dr. Sopcich. Thank you, Trustee Musil. Um, appreciate this opportunity. Last report. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask all the board members to make sure that you read the um, monthly report to the board. It's, a cons it's amazing when you look through this because it's almost as if it was a normal semester. And we all know that it wasn't. And it reflects a lot of intense work um, across the board, um, every, across every aspect of this campus. I would like to recognize Dr. Weber for his leadership and getting us to where we are the leadership in the IRT and all the different groups, a big role um, in having the campus continue to function. One of the things that's kind of remarkable is when you look at our enrollment for the summer, we are up 0.1%, but we're up. Uh, continue to other schools, that's pretty, that's pretty doggone good. Uh, and we're even more so in credit hours, a couple points, uh, which is fantastic. Again, it reflects an incredible team effort across so many different areas um, to make this stuff happen. I'd like to recognize Jim and the faculty for their, for their participation in this, in this uh, endeavor. Um, before I get to the crux of what I'm going to say tonight, I'd like to give a few minutes to John Clayton. Um, on May 29th, I sent out the HLC uh, findings of a report that was submitted. Um, they accepted what we had done um, that didn't happen uh, without a lot of effort and determination. I don't know if the board's aware that that's not, this isn't the first time that this campus has tried um, some type of governance uh, approach to shared governance. If you'd like to read Chuck Bishop's uh, biography of the college, um, you might want to check it out because um, like a lot of things that can happen in higher ed, you get a good start and it slows down and it disappears and people act like it never happened. In this case, this is only going to succeed without a unified, it'll only succeed with a unified board and of course a unified campus to make this governance work. So John, I'll turn this over to you and you can take us through, through, um, take us through a few slides. All right, thank you. Uh, one of the things I wanted to just kind of briefly do is walk a little, through a little bit of history. Um, where does shared governance come from? Um, when you actually read through the criteria for from our regional creditor, you don't actually see the words shared governance, but it's there. Um, in the assumed practice, uh, the Board of Trustees have the responsibility for the annual budget, engage, dismiss the Chief Executive Officer. Faculty have the responsibility to participate sub substantially in the oversight of curriculum and assessment. I believe that's what Dr. Liker was talking about earlier when he's talking about being held responsible and having an active role in what they do and oversee what they do. When you move on into the criteria for education or for accreditation, the board of trustees are to delegate the day-to-day -day management of the institution to the administration and expect faculty to oversee academic matters. Administration, faculty, staff, and students are involved in setting academic requirements, policies, and processes through effective structures for contrib contrib contribution and collaborative effort. Never says shared governance, but that's all referring to shared governance. So what do the principles of shared governance consist of? As Dr. Sopcich mentioned, the board should commit to ensuring a broad understanding of what shared governance is and the value it offers for the institution. For shared governance to work, it must be based on a culture of meaningful engagement across the campus. It can't just be one area, it has to be all areas engaged. And then we need to 
review our institutional policies that define shared governance periodically to make sure that they're current with what's going on in our environment around us as well as upon our campus. So what's been the recent journey for shared governance? Well, as some of you on the board under, I remember back, we had an HLC site visit and the spring of 18, the site team recommended an interim report around our shared governance, but primarily focused upon communication. What were our processes and protocols? How did we communicate up and down the, the structure of the organization? How, what was our shared governance when decisions were made? How did we communicate those things? We uh, did a report on that, provided that report to them. Um, it, was, it was done primarily through the Vice President of Academic Affairs Office, through the President of the Faculty Association at the time, and through the President of the Faculty Senate. HLC then took that report and said, that's good, you've got report due May 1st, very short time frame, basically two terms. And basically what it was is they had heard that Joe was retiring and they wanted it done on his tenure. They wanted it completed before he left us. Excuse so me, I tried to convince them otherwise, but <laughs> uh, it didn't, didn't work. So their, their response to us was the institution is required to submit additional report on faculty voice within the shared governance system at JCCC. The report is to be submitted no later than May 1st. So what was our response to that? The, the institution set up two task force to focus on shared governance. The first one was the Academic Shared Governance Task Force, and that was their charge was to research and provide recommendation to the Chief Academic Officer on an appropriate policy structure for faculty shared governance, complete with an operational practices framework for policy structure. And then as we were looking through that, we identified that we didn't have a clear framework for institutional shared governance. And so on top of that, the institution uh, set up an institutional shared governance task force that was had two charges. Theirs was to research and provide recommendation to cabinet regarding an appropriate policy structure for institutional wide shared governance, which is where our shared governance philosophy statement came in. And then a research and provide recommendation to the cabinet regarding the operational framework. How should we put shared governance in practice for the institution? our process of going through the shared governance was a shared governance activity. The Institutional Shared Governance Task Force had three administrators, three faculty members, three professional staff members, one hourly staff member, and one student. The Academic Shared Governance Task Force was represented by vote from each of the divisions. They actually voted on who they wanted to represent them, as well as the academic branch staff had representation, as well as the counselors, since they hold faculty uh, rec rec recognition here at the college also had representation on there. It was a shared governance activity. So what results came from these task force? Let's look at the institutional shared governance first. The development of the shared governance philosophy statement. I think you guys have all seen that numerous times and I believe endorsed that at the April meeting. Out of that though, to make it operational, they recommended that we create a college council a broad representation of individuals from across campus that would contain one board of trustee member, one administration member from the cabinet, three faculty members, three staff members, and one student member, a true representation of our, our makeup across campus. Now, while some of the other, some of the membership guidelines were clear for some of the areas, it was not clear how the staff should designate their shared governance representation. So that was another recommendation that they made is that the staff needs to have a task force set up to identify how they would do shared governance and who they would send to represent them. In the academic shared governance branch, they were instructed that they needed to move to one faculty voice. That was an outcome from this. Through that, they developed the academic branch council, the ABC as Dr. Liker referred to earlier. While the Senate was never formally recognized as a body of the college, the ABC started fall, starting fall of 2020 will be under the direction and the authority of the Office of the Chief, Chief Academic Officer, and the college will begin immediately working to build this body as the official governance body of the academic branch representing the instruction and faculty on this campus. Now to what Dr. Sopcich was referring to earlier, the outcome of our submission to the HLC. So we had to do a, a, a short report, about 10 pages, 
um, very limited. They, they want it brief and succinct. The response we got back to them, and this is a quote, on behalf of the Higher Learning Commission, staff received the report on faculty voice within the shared governance system. No further reports are required. We have met their standards by what they, we've, we've made it for, far enough down the path to meet their, their needs and their, their, uh, what they required of us. Now, the next thing though is the Open Pathway Assurance Review is scheduled for 2021-2022. The institution's next reaffirmation of accreditation is scheduled for 2027-2028. So what does that mean? The Open Pathway Assurance Review, that's a kind of a mid-cycle review. So they're, they're going to, we're going to have to write a report coming up and submit that to the Higher Learning Commission, another report due in about two years. They're going to, part of that report is going to be how well we are doing on shared governance. What are we doing? How, where have we progressed from this May 1st report to now? But we do have full accreditation. Okay, so we're not on any sanctions, nothing that way. We're fully accredited until 2027, 2028. Doesn't mean we couldn't get in trouble with them for actions we do in the interim part, but we are fully accredited. So what are our next steps? It's the implementation across the institution for the institutional governance philosophy statement and framework. And that needs to happen summer and fall of 2020. What's, what's that include? That includes the creation of the college council. That includes the creation of a staff shared governance task force that's, that's coming down the pipeline that will need to occur once we get to back to some normalcy. How about the academic branch? That's going to be the implementation of the ABC, the A Academic Branch Council. That will, it's, as Dr. Leiker has referred, has been kicked off and it is will be going stronger come fall of 2020. The creation of one faculty voice is something else that's going to need to be focused on. And then what, what will the accreditation folks on campus be working on? We're going to start working on writing our assurance argument for that interim midterm report for submission to HLC in 2021-2022. So Joe, your last presentation here at the, at the board and you get to talk about your favorite thing, accreditation. HLC. HLC. Um, one of, the big, um, one of the, the big wins on this that all schools strive for when they go through this process, and not all schools get it, is that 10-year accreditation. That in some ways seems to have been um, downplayed around this place. That was a huge accomplishment for us, something we can all be proud of. John mentioned the one voice, and I was so encouraged by Jim's comments with regard to how the FA will work with the ABC. The ABC must be recognized as the voice in the academic, in the academic branch. I mean, that was loud and clear from that site visit uh, when they talked to us afterwards. So this is going to be a huge carry, um, a huge lift, because other organizations as well have often seen themselves in that role. That role is now in the hands of the ABC. So it's so important to make sure that everybody understands that and falls in line with that direction. Um, John, when did you say they're gonna come back for, a, a, for like an interim? So the, the interim visit will be 2021, 2022. Yeah, and that corner. won't actually be a visit. That will we'll submit a report to them. They'll read the report about what we've accomplished. And assuming there's no red flags in that report, we will be good to go then until 2027, 2028. So is every, does everyone, does anyone have any questions on this? Questions from the board? Sure. Trustee Cross. Briefly, uh, I, I thank you for your work on this, John, uh, Mr. Clayton and, and Dr. Sobchak. Um, is it HLC or it's it's uh, the League for Innovation? We have to undergo when you after your retirement, we have to undergo another review. The League for Innovation, well, you have to be reaccredited or reaffirmed. I think is the appropriate word into the league uh, when the president steps down. Um, that'll probably I'm not sure it starts up really soon. Randy's are up in that in that capacity. Um, so I've confused the issue. I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't mean to waste time. Yeah, it's a totally different thing. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, if we, if we don't get reaffirmed by the league, um, we'll survive. If you don't get reaccredited by the HLC, you got a problem. Yep. Okay. Yeah, great question. That'll be a good exercise for everybody um, around the table. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at my hair. Um, <laughs> I've got so much grease on that, that it, it, so to weigh it down. Um, one of the, the, the biggest, one, the big issue of today really is obviously, um, Oh, John, thank you. Thank you for that summary. Is uh, the topic of race. 
it's something that's been brought to the forefront. I mean, I grew up here. I remember 19, late 1960s when Martin Luther King was, uh, was killed and the resulting violence and, and damage that occurred in Kansas City. I remember Bobby Kennedy's speech in Indianapolis when he got in the back of a, black, in a, fa of a flatbed truck. He got on the back of a flatbed truck and gave one of the most eloquent speeches that calmed, that calmed the big crowd and there was no violence in Indianapolis. That was real leadership. He spoke with great empathy and he spoke from the heart. And that is obviously one of our biggest challenges today. Uh, this morning, um, one, of the, the, one of the most enjoyable things, one of the best memories I'll have from here is uh, an, an occasional breakfast, which is more than occasional, with a couple of our custodians. Both of them are black. We kind of started bonding over um, Kansas City sports history in the 1950s uh, and 60s when um, that was my time in the 70s and it was theirs as well. Uh, we talked about old municipal stadium, the Kansas City A's. Um, we talked about um, the, in the 1960s, ABC telecasts of the NBA, Oscar Robertson, Will Chamberlain, all of that. Today, it was kind of interesting because I think um, this has given us an opportunity to talk, about, to talk about race. It's not an easy topic for people to broach. How do you do that? How do you ask a person with black skin, what's it like to be black? and to hear their perspectives and what it was like. Um, recently, a letter was circulated from, uh, from my university uh, from, a, from a black football player in the 90s. And he talked about what it's like raising his children and the fears that he has simply when they go outside. And you gotta kind of put yourself in that situation. How would you respond to that? I mean, I, I go for runs, I like to run. Sometimes I find myself in some pretty interesting spots. I can't even comprehend the horror to be hunted down and murdered like that gentleman was in Georgia. Nor can I comprehend what it's like. And my daughter runs. What it would be like to have your child hunted down and murdered just because of the color of his skin. These are the types of discussions that if anything good, if anything good can come from this, to be able to, to, to talk and listen and to listen what it is like to live in our society, to live in our community with black skin. I think one of the things that this board never really gets to hear are a lot of the things that we do on campus already in a step toward that direction. When the discussion came up on diversity, equity, and inclusion, I had asked, um, I'd ask for some information, and this is from the academic year of 1819. Exactly what are we doing on campus with regards to that, what are we trying? What are we doing to trying to expand our horizons? I got a bunch of lists. You got to love lists, right? But this one has 62 different courses. Kudos to the faculty for incorporating for incorporating issues of diversity in their regular coursework. The beauty of this is that many of these are also they also fulfill a general education requirement. I'm not going to read all 62 of these courses, but I am going to read some of them. World cultures, Native Americans, American Indian artistic tradition, US Latino and Latina literature, literature by women, introduction to globalization, African American studies, Islam, religion and civilization, North American Indian history, history of the Middle East, Islam, religion, religion civilization, history of rock and roll music, history of Asian philosophy, social psychology, religions of the East, religions of the West, Islam, religion, civilization, social problems, introduction to social work and social welfare, sociology of community, global women's studies, the many women of Islam. In our non-core credit offerings, leveraging diversity, building intercultural work teams, breaking down barriers through awareness, unconscious bias, building intercultural healthcare teams, bridging differences, finding solutions. These are some of the things that our college does in the classroom. We do that out of an institutional desire to try to understand, not just about, is about issues of race, but also about issues of religious diversity as well, cultural diversity. Then I asked, okay, what are we doing with regards to getting people on campus, right? 
I mean, we hosted, this college hosted the Johnson County celebration of uh, Martin Luther King Day on our campus in Yardley Hall. We hosted it two years in a row. Kudos to Chris Gray's team, to Emily Berman, to Kate Allen. They were, they were fascinating, wonderful productions. That's something that we stepped up and we did on our campus. I've also taken a very um, involved role in trying to get any type of Hispanic organization on our campus. I've worked with the Hispanic Chambers. I've worked with um, uh, organizations in the, in the metropolitan area trying to get people on our campus so they can get a grasp of what it's like to being on a college campus, not just students, but their families. So I'm going to read some of these names. This is about 17, 18 pages on a spreadsheet of things that happened on our campus in 1718. The Indian Dance Graduation, the Baraka Church Conference, the let's see, Kansas City Christmas sang by the Heart, performed by Heartland Men's Chorus, the Chinese New Year Celebration 2018, Chef Maron returns to Middle Eastern menu June 26th through 29th. Our international programs, extremely diverse, about Argentina, our JCC International da Dance Club. It says seeks a faculty or staff advisor. Jim, you might want to sign up for that one. Um, international Relations Council, Multicultural Programming Advisory Council, the Charlottesville Conversation Today. Smith discusses women's roles in ancient times at first great books lecture. Registration open for Diversidad Conference. Kansas Studies Institute sponsors registration for staff faculty to Hispanic Conference. Welcome reception this Thursday for visiting teachers from China. Amigos Sin Fronteras Spanish Club meets today. DACA program. This is a discussion that we held on our campus with regards to DACA. History professors analyze removal of Confederate, remo of Confederate memorials, ASL and interpreting education, Multicultural Programming Advisory Council coffee, El Centro visit plan to JCCC, free Mandarin Chinese language classes, College Scholar Easley Geraldo presents on global politics, Maya Daykeeper shares elements, you get the point. This goes on and on and on, and in many cases, it's a huge commitment from faculty who often take the lead on this and staff to make these things happen. But you know, to, to, to do these types of things or to write a letter, that's easy. I mean, that is a real easy thing for everybody to do. You've seen a lot of them. I wrote one, um, I have to confess with the help of, of Dr. Um, McLeod and Chris Gray. Um, I've seen my old things out right and left. But what are going to, what's going to be the outcome of all this? What is going to happen? And what's going to happen at this college? This is a great opportunity for this college. It's a great opportunity to do something that makes a difference and that could maybe, maybe serve underserved populations. Now, one of the things about being the outgoing president is that you can pretty much, you can say whatever you want, right? And you can also um, give challenges that you don't ever have to worry about stepping up for. But here are some things that you want to talk about because the nice discussion by the trustees was, was outstanding. Um, I got five points here. Now I can tell you Dr. Weber, Dr. McLeod, some of the, the cabinet members across this table are going to cringe. But our last meeting was on Tuesday, so I don't have to face you guys again. First, Standardized testing. Standardized testing discriminates against the underserved and zero privileged populations and decisively favors those raised in a privileged household. It even discriminates against seniors who may want to change a career, those who have chalked up great accomplishments in their lives, but now that opportunity that they seek is limited due to some antiquated screening device, which is called standardized testing. I for one was never that's successful with standardized testing, but neither of my parents went to college. And when you have a family member who goes to college, you've got a huge advantage over somebody who doesn't. And most of the populations that we're talking about, they don't have that benefit. So today, in today's world, universities, state systems, the state of California, they're dropping this. They're looking at something called multiple measures. 
multiple majors, which documents the accomplishments across an entire student's academic career. Rather, rather than a 60 minute experience with a number two pencil and a fill in the dot sheet. So the question is, what about Johnson County Community College? How do we use standardized testing? What areas of our college persist and cling to this device that is used as a screening device, which in the process limits those who might be able to do great things, but struck out, struck out when they had a chance, when they had the opportunity, when they had to take a standardized test? Something to think about. Second one, develop, de develop, developmental education. Developmental education. Does anyone around this table, and this isn't for a member of the cabinet, know what other schools are doing and why they're doing it? Does segregating students based on their current ability rather than their desire and potential for academic growth, does that really produce, does that merit the investment that we make in developmental education? I passed out a book to every trustee. I'd, I'd like to give a test to them because the book is called 13 Ideas That Are Transforming Community Colleges. There's a lot in there about developmental education. But I'm gonna tell you, Johnson County Community College, 13 ideas, we're not even listed in the index. You gotta look at how much we're spending on developmental education, and this isn't about money. Then you look at the results. Are those students advancing beyond that? Those are just questions. You gotta find the answers. The bureaucracy. I give a lot of credit to Dr. Weber and his team for, for exercising um, a process where they were breaking down barriers. But do we have institutional barriers for students to enroll here to seek help that make it extra difficult for them? And then we expect students who are intimidated just by our campus to come in and navigate this? Stuff like the complexity to enroll or to seek counseling Sometimes these groups that need help the most are denied simply because our response is, we just don't do it that way. The need is to put the students first and to work toward their success rather than hold on for dear life to bureaucratic norms that we've had. Number four, completion success. Will this institution be willing to focus on the outcomes of students, white students compared to black and brown students? Anne Arundel College in Maryland, they, they inspired their whole campus. They brought everybody together to try to close the gap, the performance gap between white students and black students and brown students. And they're making progress, they're succeeding but it takes an entire campus and great focus to make that happen. Trying to equalize completion and graduations across those groups. This is real stuff. This, this isn't writing a letter. This is what a campus can do if it has the will and the passion to get it done. Number five, hiring. This college, and Becky, don't take this personal because I've already insult, I've already kind of, you know, Mickey's down there and, and Randy, and they're probably a little uptight about some of this stuff. So don't you, don't you either. This college needs to go through a study of its hiring practices, faculty and staff. That's easily done. The facts are there, somebody's just gotta lay it out. I'd suggest a five or 10 year trend on who gets hired and why they get hired for staff and faculty. And how do we do this? Do our system, does our system, does it favor those from privileged backgrounds? Because when we value experience at the level that we do, that immediately discounts, immediately discounts those who've had to scrap on their own to try to get to a certain level. What do we do? What is our outreach to various communities? And also does diversity here at Johnson County Community College include diversity of thought? How open are groups to people with different ideologies? Truly, that enriches an entire campus to hear more than just one point of view. Oftentimes, that is lost in the discussion of color. Is this institution ready to have such a rock solid commitment?
to diversifying its workforce, that it is willing, willing to watch market-driven premiums paid to attract the best candidate and also a candidate, and that candidate may be a candidate of color. Because I'm just telling you, the marketplace is going to pay premiums. But at our place, the most read part of that, of the um, book that goes out, what do you call it, the, the, the board trustee book, I forgot it, board packet, sorry. I've only been here 28 years, um, is your personnel section. Everybody here can tell you what everybody makes. Everybody can tell you what when somebody gets a, a promotion or they get this or that. And everybody, that's just the way it is. That's the first thing that people go to. So the question is, when somebody gets hired, are we willing to pay that person a little bit extra, a little bit extra more? It might not go beyond what we normally do and what's acceptable to get them in here. And it's not about the color. It's about the quality. It's about what they can do. And the, and the fact is maybe their skin just happens to be black or brown. So that's about institutional will when it comes to hiring. Because certainly, we all like to hire people that are kind of like ourselves, right? It's easy. And we like people who are gonna go along. The challenge is to break that mold and hire people who are unlike us, be they a different color or a different way of thinking. And if you really want a diverse institution, that's what you have to do and sacrifices will have to be made to get that to happen. So, now since I've laid out those challenges, um, I'd like to thank you, thank you all. I'd like to thank you all for, for listening to me rant like that. Um, but it's something that um, I, I, I've been reading all these letters, they're worthless. What's gonna matter is action. And the action is only gonna happen if people are committed to making this happen and we can all have a better society as a result. And so, Mr. Chair, that concludes my final report. That is an impressive final report. Um, in my nine years, there have been a lot of impressive reports. Um, none probably more timely than that. Um, I'm going to remember that, and we're, we're going to have a, a chance to all of us to, to make comments about you at the end, but we all did an implicit bias training in, before we started the presidential interviews. Um, I think it was a great learning experience for this board. I think most of us had done something in the past, but it was a great experience. You mentioned Charlottesville, and I know that the Charlottesville March, I believe, and the death there occurred the day before the August uh, all faculty, all staff convocation, because I was speaking the next morning, and I recalled that because it was walking on streets I had walked as a, as a law student. And th those kind of things have profound effects. So I think you've laid out some really great challenges for us, ones we all knew about, uh, but we have a we have a challenge now. And uh, Dr. Bound is watching, so uh, he is writing these down as we speak. Um, um, I'm ready to move on to new business if everybody else is. Good. First item on new business involves Dr. Bound. Um, you had circulated to you on Friday um, a proposal um, or an amendment to his the employment contract we approved back in March. Dr. Bound had submitted information initially, well, I guess to me and to uh, Dr. Cook and Trustee Smith Everett as members of the presidential transition team, indicating what the expenses were going to be to him and his family to move here. Our initial uh, contract had authorized up to $25,000 worth of reimbursement um, because of various various um, items in his move and in storage and moving costs, uh, relocating his family uh, for a period of time uh, before their house is ready here in town. He anticipates those expenses are going to approach $30,000, $30, but not exceed that. The amendment you have in front of you authorizes an amendment that would allow reimbursable expenses based on documentation up to $35,000. Um, we don't expect to go above thirty, dollars but we didn't want to have to come back to this board and, and let him have to wait for reimbursement for costs that he's going to need to move his family here. So that is the purpose of the amendment. Um, and if I get a motion and a second on that, then we can have discussion. I will move passage of the amendment. And I second. Will second. 
Uh, Mr. Can I ask for a substitute motion to add that you have the authority by the by the board to go up to 40,000 if in the event that there is additional expenses that you don't have to come back to the board? Um, you may after I call the motion in the second. Dr. Oh, okay. Kirk, Dr. Kirk, Dr. Cook, <laughs> Captain Kirk, Dr. Cook moved. Trustee Smith Everett seconded to approve the amendment as presented. Um, Trustee Lawson, you have a motion to amend that to grant the chair authority to reimburse up to 40,000 with documentation. Is that, I understand that? Uh, that is correct. Okay. Second. Seconded by Trustee Cross. Uh, I'm looking at Kelsey Nazar, our legal counsel. We can make that amendment in there and present it to Dr. Bound. Dr. Bound has seen this amendment and approved it. I doubt he would have an objection to that. So I think I think if, if it's the will of the board, we can do that. He truly believes he will be at 30,000 or below, uh, but believed he would exceed 25,000. So um, will any discussion on the amendment? Mr. Chair, if I may. You may. Is now a good time to say I told you so, or should I wait? Lee, it's always you know. a good time for you to tell me I told you so. <laughs> I want to see you. No uh, any further discussion on the amendment? I would just like to offer that this should and is set to include all uh, incurred costs for his move, including um, traveling here to be able to find the home and relocate and any auxiliary travel that would probably have happened without COVID and may, may still happen. I just want right. to make sure that covers those costs. Very fair. Thank you for bringing that up, Trustee Smith Everett, because we did uh, somewhat in increase the language because the language said he could exceed 25,000 only if he had a two houses for 90 days. Um, what we have tried to do here is say, if you have a legitimate expense incurred because of your move uh, of you and your family, we will cover it up to 35,000. And now with my discretion to go to 40. Um, so good point. All in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The amendment passes, which means we have the regular motion on the table, which now includes 35,000, but up to 40,000 at the discretion of the chair with reimbursable documentation. Any discussion on the main motion? Not all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. That motion also carries unanimously. Thank you for that item of new business. Um, Trustee Lawson, you had, uh, I think you intended to offer a motion to add tomorrow, Juneteenth, as a paid holiday. Um, I guess I will note for the record that we have a policy that establishes all the paid holidays for the year. The master agreement identifies those holidays separately for full-time faculty based on their eight, nine, or 12-month contract. I'm looking at Dr. Liker. I believe that to be true. So there would be a different impact on different employees, depending on whether they're on employed on June 19th. In addition, employees have a floating holiday that they're allowed to take. Um, so I guess do you, you would have to first offer or move to amend the agenda to include a new agenda item, which would be to add another paid holiday for uh, Johnson County Community College employees. Is that the motion you're going to make? Uh, okay, so Mr. Chair, then I would like to make a motion to amend the agenda to include the, let me make sure I'm doing this right, that Juneteenth, uh, that is June 19th as a paid holiday for our employees. I believe that there's numerous companies around the country already doing so, Sprint, University of Virginia, Casey Chiefs, Casey Royals. I think we can do this as well. And I know Juneteenth cannot be about just a day off for white people on the backs of suffering of so many. It has to be about a chance to give us a uh, better way to reflect from the sins of our nation, uh, whether we want to admit it or not. Everyone who is not an immigrant or a refugee has benefited directly and continues to benefit. Uh, we need a day to acknowledge what has been done and a day that says we have to remember the harm. So I would like to uh, make a motion uh, to give our, our employees a paid holiday. That would be a motion to amend or to add that agenda item. It is not a motion 
on the substance of the proposal. Is there a second? I'll second. Trustee Smith seconded. The motion before us is to add an agenda item that would then lead to consideration of a motion, possible consideration of a motion to add another paid holiday, in this case, June uh, 19th. Um, Dr. Trustee Cook. I have a question for legal counsel. What does this do to our negotiating agreement with the faculty association? Uh, is it, does this open the door then when anybody has an idea in between negotiation sessions to add or subtract a paid holiday? I don't think we can renegotiate the agreement tonight. It is what it is, but I, I mean, in terms of the practical effect of it, I mean, maybe Becky can speak to how that would work through HR. Uh, Mr. Liker, Dr. Liker. I, I think what would have to happen in that event is that the, um, the master agreement would have to be amended in the next negotiation round to reflect any addition of that paid holiday. And I, I would also follow up on Trustee Lawson's suggestion that this not simply be a day off for white people. We have plenty of um, groups on campus, I think, who could be trusted to form some sort of an advisory group that would be responsible for every year putting together some sort of recognition celebration um, on Juneteenth that would go along with what the board would would approve as a change. I, I will be voting against the motion. I don't think there are very many times when we need to add items to the agenda. I'm very well aware of the criticisms that this board has taken about transparency and making sure the public knows what we're doing. Nobody had any notice of this. Nobody knows this was gonna be suggested. It is not something that's in our policies. It would, it would be something appropriate for the Human Resources Committee to, to consider. It has a budget impact that hasn't been budgeted for in the budget. And for all of those reasons, I think it is at best premature and at worst unwise to add something like this to the agenda, um, basically um, on the spur of the moment. So I will be voting against the amendment to add it to the agenda. Uh, I'm not taking a position on the substance of it, but if we are to be a transparent entity, if we are to have policies and procedures that I keep hearing I, I violate, if we're to follow the rules that the bo this body has, then I suggest we follow the rules tonight on July 16th at our next meeting and thereafter. Um, and this would not be following our rules. Um, any other discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Trustee Cross. I think in the spirit of uh, President Dr. Sopcich's um, final uh, statement to us tonight, and really the spirit of his diversity in the time he's here, you know, the first ever minority trustee in the most diverse cabinet we've ever had, uh, for the sound of two people that didn't go to college with the Croatian name, and I, I believe Catholic. I've never asked, but I assume going to Notre Dame, and as the son of a Catholic woman, admired him for that. I think that it would be appropriate to do tonight, and it is certainly by the rules. We have new business for a reason, and I think in the question posed by Dr. Sopcic, what will we do? I think it starts here and now. I think it was Dr. King has said, there's nothing like the fierce urgency of now. I'm not sure I disagree with you from a legal standpoint or what you're saying substantively. However, I think now is a good time. I'll be voting yes. Any other discussion on the motion to add this to the agenda? If not. Uh, Mr. Chair, Dr. Sobchak has called on us to be better and we have time to consider this moving forward. Uh, no, I understand that, but you're asking for it to be implemented tonight for tomorrow, right? Uh, correct. Okay. Well, right now, we're just adding it to the agenda. <laughs> yeah, we're adding it to the agenda. The motion to add it to the agenda, I'm going to call individually. Trustee Lawson? Are you calling for a vote? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do kind of a roll call, if you will. 
Oh, okay. Yes, I'm in favor of adding this to the agenda. Okay. Trustee Smith Everett? Yes. Trustee Cook? No. Trustee Ingram? Yes. Trustee Snyder? No. Trustee Cross? Aye. Trustee Musil, no. It is added to the agenda by a vote of four to three. Okay, we now have uh, the uh, item on the agenda. Am I doing this right, Kelsey? Okay. Would you state your motion again, Trustee Lawson? Uh, yes, sir, uh, Mr. Chair. I motion that we make Juneteenth, June 19th as a paid holiday for our employees. And just so I'm clear, is that for 2020 or is that is your intention to do that in perpetuity? I'm uh, for tomorrow, but I'm open to amendments. If I may. Okay, so I, I, no, just, I just wanna make sure we have the motion. The motion is to make June 19th, 2020, a paid holiday for all Johnson County Community College employees. Is there a second? What, what's the motion for tomorrow, right? 2020? 20, 2000, June 19th, 2020, as I understand the motion. Question. And other, other businesses are doing this. Um, yes, Mr. Cross, or Trustee Cross, excuse me. Is if the trustee would yield for a question. Uh, we don't have a second, but I'll let you ask Trustee Lawson a question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would think it makes some sense in, in light of what Trustee Chair Musil is saying that we have some vetting of this that would be an appropriate thing that I know Congress or the White House or any state legislature would do in my political experience is to vet an issue to see what it would be worth. I'd sure like to do it for tomorrow. Uh, I'll vote for your uh, motion. Should you want to do it for tomorrow, I think it would make some prudent financial sense that we review it and allow our paid professional staff, who I think are eager for a day off, I'm not hearing too many objections around the table here, um, that we set it for 2021, but we take action tonight, incorporating and allowing our professional staff to do their job. Would you amend uh, it to 2021? I accept your friendly amendment, uh, Trustee Cross, and let's uh, make it for 2021 so that HR has more time. Thank you so much. So the, the motion is made now is for June, June 19th, 2021, would be a paid holiday for Johnson County Community College employees. Um, is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Smith Everett. Mr. Chairman. Further discussion, Trustee Snyder. I have an amendment, and that amendment would be that the HR committee look at this issue and bring it back to us at an appropriate time so we can do all of our due diligence and understand what the implications are. I just so that, that would be my motion, to amend her motion. And the, the rationale for that is it's almost nine o'clock. Chris Gray will have to turn around and send an email to everyone. They'll have to figure out whether that's a spam email or not. Talk to their supervisors. Everyone will have to figure out. I guess we change it. 21, do that. Well, I, I, I would like, so I amend that. I take that back. Um, I appreciate the trustee Lawson uh, named several organizations that have already done this. Uh, I would like to see that in writing. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any. I don't know whether they also uh, provide days off for Martin Luther King Day like we do and have some of the other benefits that we do. Um, so I would just like to understand all that before we vote. I, I think it's a, a great idea to consider. I'm just not prepared to vote on something like that tonight. I'm, uh, the motion to amend then is to refer this to the HR committee for further consideration. Is there a second to that? Second. Seconded by Trustee Ingram. Discussion on the amendment? I, I'll, I'll support the amendment. That, that's the process that ought to be done. And I doubt if any of those places did it in a period of 35 minutes making the decision that they made which is what we're being asked to do tonight um, with no, uh, no preview, no notice or anything else. So um, it, it, is, it is frustrating that we're being placed in a position that if we support our procedures and our rules and our desire to be transparent, that we will be noted on social media, I don't doubt, as being somehow bigoted, anti-black, 
anti-black lives matters, pro-slavery, who knows what, because we've been presented this at 825 on the night of our meeting. So I think the- Point of order, Mr. Chair, I actually- no, There's no point of order when I'm speaking to Trustee Lawson. Trustee so, Lawson, are you I'm speaking, there's no, chair to there's no point debate? of order. There's if no you're point of order. Debate, you have to recuse yourself as the chair. Now, I, I don't recuse myself and there's no point of order at this point. You will have you, your chance to speak. Are you debating? I am commenting on the motion that is on the floor, which I have the right to do as you do. But if you're the chair, you are supposed to stay neutral and you cannot be swaying for if you're supportive, then your chair position needs to be moved to a vice chair, or trustee uh, Snyder. Every trustee chair since 1970 at this college and since 1970 when the statute was passed has been a voting member of everybody. I vote on everything. I'm not like a mayor where I vote where my vote makes a difference. I am not expected to be neutral in positions before this board. I never have been, and I've voted on everything so far tonight. The fact that you don't like how I might vote on this one does not change that. Um, we will be, we've been put in a position of acting like we don't support Black Lives Matter, of acting like we don't support reform of police, of acting like we promote white privilege. I resent that because that's the trap that is being that we're being placed in. And we have policies, this, this board, this college has had non-discrimination policies ahead of other schools. We added gender identity to our non-discrimination before other people did and before it was required. So I think for all of those reasons, referral to the HR committee for consideration to bring back to this board so we all have the information um, and how it affects all of our employees would be an appropriate, an appropriate um, vote tonight. Trustee Ingram, you had your hand up. Well, and I, I just wanted to make it clear the reason that I voted for it to be placed on the agenda was so that we could have a little bit of further discussion about it. Um, I come from a community in Olathe that has celebrated Juneteenth for a number of years. So I am completely supportive of it, but I do believe in poli the policies and procedures. And I think to turn around and try to do it tomorrow. Um, it's, it's 2021, the motion now is 2021. Right, right. But, right. But, but originally to have thought that we could do it tomorrow is, is just unacceptable. So anyway, thank you. Trustee Lawson and then Trustee Cook. I think we have the opportunity to do this. Uh, I think that what Dr. Sovchik uh, stated very eloquently uh, moves us to be able to be better. I think we can. And the motion has been amended to 2021 and we can be able to do that. I think we have the option to make sure we stay within our own rules. And I would be in favor of making sure that we have the opportunity to support this holiday for our employees. Trustee Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm not sure where we are. I guess if we vote for the amendment to study it back to human resources, does that then mean we also then approve or we'll vote, I guess, on the motion to apply for 2021? I'm just not very comfortable in making decisions after four hours of meeting here. We have another lengthy meeting tonight. It seems to be the practice of this board to bring items to a board meeting and not discuss them prior to the board meeting with the related parties. I have nothing against the idea. I have nothing against the concept. Uh, I, I uh, would like to see us consider all these uh, holidays and events through a, through a structured process of discussion rather than on the spur of the moment, moment when we've been sitting here all night long uh, dealing with surprises. So I'm going to vote no on everything. Not that I'm against everything, because I think we need, we need to discuss it, but not at the spur of the moment. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Trustee Smith Everett. For the next two years in 21 and in 22, these holidays are on the weekends. So I believe we have the opportunity to visit this through the right procedures and policies, which is through our HR committee. I am lost where we are in terms of the motion and what 
process we would go through, but I would advocate for the process to go through our regular committee process with the intention that the HR committee present a policy on the on Juneteenth as a holiday and the financial impact that it would have. Here's where we are procedurally. The original motion, well, the amended original motion by friendly amendment is to create June Juneteenth, June 19, 2021 as a paid holiday. The amendment to that is to refer the matter to the HR committee for consideration and uh, bringing it back to this board. So what we're voting on, what we'll be voting on first is the amendment, which would refer it to HR to have that brought back to this board through the committee process. Is everybody clear on that? Okay. Um, all right, I'm gonna, one last thing, if I may. Trustee Cross. You know, I've had my disagreements with Trustee Lawson. Uh, anybody that knows me knows that. Uh, but not for nothing, she has no other remedy. She's not on any committee. She has no opportunity to bring this up. Um, I say this not in her defense, just as a practical and logistical matter to address the situation we're in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Trustee Snyder. If I can address. Uh, Trustee Cross, um, I, I guess I, I would refute that. It is true that she is not on a committee. However, the chair has been given wide latitude to anyone that wants a topic for consideration on an agenda to get it to him with specifics seven days in advance. So had this been requested, I'm quite certain that, that the chair would have put this on the agenda. Likewise, had Trustee Lawson indicated that she wanted to have some sort of recognition of Black Lives Matter, I'm certain the chair would have put that on the agenda as well. But instead, she hid what that agenda item was. So that uh, we Trustee Snyder, point of order, you cannot attack me. You cannot attack me. That is against our code of conduct policy. And there's many actual in writing of times where you have been added to the agenda yourself. So your arguments need to be substantiated by documents that I uh, that you cannot state. So Mr. please Lawson, me. Trustee Snyder has the floor. Uh, it doesn't mean he attacks me. Uh, it wasn't an attack, but in my view, those are all factual statements. The things that I've had added to the agenda, I've gone through the process, which I just laid out. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Uh, Trustee Cross. Just to respond, uh, Mr. Trustee Snyder, you've had 401 years, now's the time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, um, we're voting on the motion, the amendment to the motion. The amendment is to refer this to the Human Resources Committee for consideration and return to this board. Um, anybody have a confusion about that? Trustee Cross. I'm sorry, on the amendment? On the amendment. No. Trustee Snyder. Yes. Trustee Ingram. Yes. Trustee Cook. No. Trustee Smith Everett. Yes. Trustee Lawson. No. Chair votes aye. The amendment passes. The main motion now is to refer to the HR committee. Uh, the consideration of adding a Juneteenth uh, paid holiday to our holiday schedule. Is there any further discussion on that? If not, uh, Trustee Cross? Yes. Trustee Snyder? Yes. Trustee Ingram? Yes. Trustee Cook? No. Trustee Smith Everett? Yes. Trustee Lawson? Yes. Trustee Musil? Chair votes yes. That votes, that is a six to one vote. So I know that will be referred to the HR committee at the appropriate time. That it passes? It passed to refer it to the HR committee, yes. I don't have any old business. Are we ready for the consent agenda? There are most, the consent agenda is a list of uh, typically non uh, routine items that are non-controversial that have been vetted by committee or, or senior staff and are presented as one motion and for one vote. Any trustee has the right to pull anything off the consent agenda, uh, which starts at page 47 of our, of our board packet. Is there anything anybody would like to consider separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as published? So moved. Second. Moved by Dr. Cook and seconded by Trustee Ingram. 
Any discussion? Not all in favor say aye. 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 Yes. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Um, I think we're ready for the recognition of Dr. Sopcich and his service to the college, maybe a little later than we thought we'd get here, but you okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we did. Um, I, I'm going to start and just, uh, Dr. Sopcich has been here almost 28 years um, in various roles, including really building our foundation into a, a body that can, as you heard earlier tonight, give over $1.3 million in scholarships donated by private individuals and businesses in Johnson County and beyond. Um, he was in charge of the business affairs of the college as vice president and was then uh, elevated to president by this board, our previous board in 2013. He's given almost 28 years of his life to this uh, college. Um, his wife, Stacy has given an equal amount of time and probably more angst. Um, and uh, his two children have grown up, uh, gone to college, moved away, are now back, uh, COVID related and otherwise. Uh, but he's been here for 28 years and it is unfortunate that we're in a COVID-19 situation where we can't have a public reception for the people in this county to uh, come up to Joe and say thank you eye to eye. Uh, Dr. Bound is aware of this and we will plan that if there becomes a time when we can have um, public gatherings um, without social distancing. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Cook for the next portion of this tribute. Well, what we'd like to do is I think we all remember the um, video that was shown at some enchanted evening. Uh, the foundation did a wonderful job. I think, Chris, you were involved with that a little bit uh, of putting together a recap. And we thought it'd be a good opportunity to uh, go back and and look at that video again because it really captured your your career here well joe so while we might be used to netflix let's cue up the uh, the video for some enchanted evening joe and stacy what a wonderful day to celebrate your amazing partnership and all the accomplishments the two of you have helped this community achieve. There is no doubt that over the next several months you'll have the opportunity to reflect on your legacy and the kinds of things that you did. I want to do two things today. I would like to honor both of you, not just for your Johnson County Community College work, but for your work within our community. I don't remember a time that either one of you said no, and I know that your love for this county has helped us in many other ways throughout the community for our quality of life. Secondly, I'd like to talk about that legacy. There is no doubt in my mind that the biggest legacy that you two have left for our community is the Johnson County Community College Foundation. Many, many years ago, when community colleges were not doing this, a group of civic leaders came to you with a vision and you were able to make that vision happen. And so as you leave, you will know that you have built an amazing base with a foundation that helps so many students every year. You have allowed individuals to contribute to the success of the students. You have allowed the business community to be a part of helping students do better and find jobs when it's all over. So I honor you, I thank you. I know that um, there was a sacrifice in your public service. I also know that the leadership you provided will be remembered forever. So on your next journey, which I hope to be a part of, I hope to give you a big hug and we wish you all the very best, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Musil and Board of Trustees for the honor of saying a few words about Dr. Sopcich. I met Dr. Sopcich in 1999 when he was in the foundation office doing what he does so well, and that is helping students. When Joe was in the process of applying for the Johnson County Community College President's position eight years ago, I had the honor of meeting all the presidential candidates by being their campus tour guide between interviews. With his tour, I told him about we being a B faculty at Johnson County Community College. He insisted we were better than a B faculty. In fact, he said we were one of the finest faculty in the nation, but our tour ended before he could complete his argument about our faculty. 
Our relationship was very professional from the beginning, but as time progressed, we developed a personal relationship as well. Joe always asked about my family whenever we had a few minutes free. Uh, in fact, with his wise counsel, my oldest daughter, Grace, who started working on our AA while still in high school by taking College Now courses through Johnson County and attending classes on campus during the summer. Because of his wise advice two years ago, my daughter Grace received her AA from JCCC on Friday night. Two days later, she received her high school diploma. I'm proud to tell Joe that Grace is earning her bachelor's degree from Kansas State University this coming December with two majors. Joe and I had, had, Joe and I had a friendly rivalry where he is a diehard Notre Dame football fan and I, as a Californian by birth, was a University of Southern California football fan. That was truly fun rivalry. In honor of Joe's retirement, I want him to see me one more time wearing my favorite college football team's ball cap. Go Fighting Irish. Joe, I, wish, I want to wish you and Stacy the best in your retirement for the years to come. And oh, by the way, Joe, uh, saying we were a beef athlete, it just means that we'll be here after you retire. So rest assured that we will move forward maintaining that status as one of the finest faculty in the nation. Thank you for your support and guidance over the year. Hey, Joe. I really wish I could be there in person, but I'm so excited that they're actually going to let me speak at the board meeting because I have so many things to talk about. Things that we've shared over the years, margaritas, cinnamon rolls, poppers, even tattoos. But you know, I tried to fit all that in and I just couldn't get it in time. And I decided everything that happens at Arrowhead stays at Arrowhead. So today I just wanna thank you. You know, you may not recall, but the first time we really spent any time together was when I took my first legislative summit to DC as a trustee. And you and I kind of separated from the group one morning and took a walk across the mall. And I remember, remember thinking during that walk, how am I ever going to keep up with this man? He walks so fast. Little did I know that I would spend the rest of my time as a trustee and at Johnson County Community College in a number of capacities trying to keep up with you, with your vision, with your leadership, you have accomplished so much, so many great things during your nearly 30 years at JCCC. All you have to do is walk across the campus. You can see your mark everywhere, from your time with the foundation and from your time as president of this college. Most of all, you have helped make JCCC a first-class institution for our community and most of all, for the students that we serve. My daughter is so excited to be a part of Johnson County Community College as a student, and she thanks you for that. You have touched so many people. You will be so missed. But enjoy the time with Stacy and the kids. And hey, here's looking forward to even more tailgating to come for the two of us. Congratulations, Joe. You've earned it. Joe Sopchak, I was very pleased when Chairman of the Board Greg Musil asked if I would contribute a video for your final Board of Trustees meeting. I was there in the beginning, uh, served on the Alumni Association Committee that interviewed you when you were seeking the job of Foundation uh, Manager. I wondered why a young man from Chicago would want to come to Johnson County Community College, and I found out he was from Independence, Missouri, and a William Christman Bear. You were hired, and that was a great decision. I remember our first event, alumni auction, we worked pretty hard and we raised $10,000 in that one night. Fast forward 26 years, and last November, we raised over a million dollars at some enchanted evening for scholarships. That's because of you, Joe, and the job you've done. You've impacted thousands of students who are seeking career technology certificates or transfer programs. As a board of trustee for 11 years, I witnessed firsthand when you came to the administrative side, the passion, the ethics, and the hard work you brought to the college. You have impacted many students, staff, and members in this community. The community owes you a debt of gratitude 
I hope that you and Stacy enjoy a great retirement, and I hope our paths cross many times in the future. What I'd like to end with is just job well done, Joe. Job well done. I was privileged to spend a very focused week in 09 getting to know Joe, to watch how he works. As you know, Joe has had personal experience with international service, having spent a year in Chile in the 70s. So when I came to him with a proposal to connect JCCC with potential projects in Uganda, he was not only interested, but he wanted to personally go on the scouting trip. We were roommates for that trip, and I got to watch him interact with civic and educational leaders, healthcare and religious leaders. And what I found out about him is that he is a very hands-on person who wants to see for himself, collect the data himself. I saw and in our debriefings heard how reflective and analytical he was. He kept me from being naive and helped me focus on the possible. And when we got back to Kansas City, he taught me about follow-up and development. What he personally did to expand international studies and relationships at JCCC, not just in Africa, but with multiple locations, was far beyond anything that I had envisioned. In this and multiple subsequent projects, he made my own dreams become a reality at JCCC more than at any other place I have worked. Joe is that rare individual who can personally gather data, evaluate problems, and then analyze and find a way to solutions, then form action plans and make the solutions a reality to actually get things done. I know maybe as much as anyone how it takes a sympathetic, compatible, supportive spouse, someone who's your constant helpmate to enable you to reach for your vision and your dreams. All I can say to Joe and Stacy is thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Turn around. Yeah, Cirque du Soleil is still coming, but um, we have a. That was a video tribute from some people that are very close to the college. Yes. And now we have. Do, do we have queued up the. That's the only one they have. Okay. Well, for those, I think a lot of us here were at some enchanted evening, and it was a great tribute to Joe's uh, history at the college. Um, and it had showed at the foundation lunch. Showed at the foundation lunch, and uh, it included surprise appearances by Stacy, uh, Kate, and Eli, which I understand what, what Joe was alerted to right before he went on stage, so he wouldn't get too emotional, um, as he might. So um, I don't know. We, we kind of lost the, the we can go to the go flow to the here. Um, well, the uh, it's. Uh, Along with Dr. Cook and, and Trustee Smith Everett, we we worked with the foundation and one announced tonight a Joe and Stacy uh, endowed scholarship. Um, we have secretly solicited funding through members of the foundation, and we will also have the opportunity to, to solicit that um, ongoing to add to this fund. Um, our, our initial goal was the $10,000 that it takes to endow a scholarship here, which can on average, allow two five hundred dollars scholarships, so a thousand dollars or a five hundred dollars scholarship. Um, John Stewart mentioned your first effort was to raise ten thousand dollars in the in the week and a half we have had this out. We've raised thirty five thousand dollars for that scholarship, and I'm sure that will be continue to grow now that it as it gets out in the community. Um, so. Um, there's another announcement, Trustee Smith Everett. Yes, we also wanted to give our uh, community an opportunity 
to wish you well. And we are remiss that in COVID era, we don't get to have big receptions and the Cirque du Soleil will come down from the ceiling and all the great things we have <laughs> planned. So in lieu of that, um, with the marketing team, we've created a digital board where um, people will be able to go on and contribute videos and um, words of congratulations to you. There will be an announcement about it tonight after this meeting, and it'll be open through June 30th for anyone who would like to contribute it from both faculty and staff, students internally, as well as some of our external partners that have worked with you over these very long 20, almost 28 years. Thank you, Trustee Smith Everett and, and Trustee Cook for helping to plan this. I'm sorry I didn't come off perfectly um, with the other video, but um, uh, now I want to give the opportunity for um, trustees to make some comments if they have any. And I think we'll all say a lot of the same stuff, but Trustee Snyder. Well, uh, Joe, I would just you know first like to reiterate and say, say thank you. I, I first met you 10, 12 years ago because of your community involvement. And, and really, as much as anything, uh, my connection with community college was through you, which is probably similar to, to how really thousands of community members have that. And so when I chose to, to run for office, it gave me some comfort that, hey, I, I know the guy in charge. It, he'll, he'll kind of point me in the right direction and tell me what I need to know and everything else. So that, that helped me, um, I, I guess, with my decision to run. And uh, clearly my, my first two, two and a half years have been under your tutelage and, and watchful eye. And, and now watching these videos, I, I feel like we should have gone on a trip together. I, I haven't taken advantage of any of those opportunities. Now I'm regretting that. But really just want to uh, wish you well and, and look forward to seeing you. I, I assume you'll remain a, a valued member of, of Johnson County. So, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, among the lasting memories I have with uh, Dr. Sumption, being in a cab in Seattle, Washington, debating and discussing Kansas politics of all the places. And uh, so many times me saying, no, don't worry about the politics. Let me worry about the politics. And Dr. Sopcich would say, yeah, <laughs> but there was a lot I had to learn. There's still a lot I need to learn. And, uh, you, you know, in, in all fairness, candor and honesty, uh, I've repeatedly called you uh, the Billy Bean of the community college your uh, maneuvering ability <clears throat> and the wisdom of Chris Kobach, who's the one that taught me and just ingrained this concept into my brain to frame the debate, to frame the issue early on when I came onto the board and we had an anti-education legislature and a governor who gave little pushback to that. Uh, your ability to navigate through some complex situations uh, in the state at the federal level, the relationships we did have and do have, excuse me, with, uh, with our federal officials to get the grants and to know about the grants and opportunities that we have, um, it really does speak to, I think what was your greatest strength was to uh, uh, establish and maintain relationships, a great uh, lesson that you among many other people at this table and in this community have taught me. Uh, and not to go on, but just to say, there were a tremendous number of great things that happened here. Uh, diversity I mentioned earlier, I meant it. I meant every word of it. I, I um, remember the night that trustee Henry Sandate, Enrique Sandate, you said his name that night. And Henry had to correct you. And he said, no, no, it's, it's Henry Sandate. It's Henry. And, and you were so proud with your background to be able to pronounce his name in Spanish. And then how thrilled you were that we had our first ever person of color that night. I, I remember that. And I remember your commitment. And I think um, the stress and strain of the job is something that many of us paid attention to on you. And, and I know that uh, in seven years, um, we've had our differences. But it is to say that, um, I've read lots of other books besides Moneyball, but I do love it so much. And I think to call you the Billy Bean of, of the community college movement, when Linda Fund would call you and ask you, what do we do, what do you think? when all the people that, that we are connected to and need to have relationships with in the, the congressional delegation, the state legislature, in the community, they call you, they ask what to do, and here we are. We have this dissent, we have some rancor, we have some good moments here tonight, and yet we're still standing. 
and we have a tremendous opportunity to move into the 21st century as a leader in the nation. And I think that speaks to your, your talent and leadership, and I appreciate you. Thank you, sir. Trustee Ingram. Joe, thank you for everything. Um, there's a couple of things that come to mind, and one of them, the first thing was, when I called to make my donation to that scholarship fund, and I inquired a little bit about it and said, you know, what's your goal? And then they told me where they had already been. Immediately, people were engaged and interested in supporting you and Stacy with all of that. So I think that's such a compliment to you and the way people feel about you in the community. Um, there was a time, and I think it was just a year ago when you came and spoke to the Olathe Chamber. And I was there early and I think we'd had some miscommunication and you weren't even sure you were supposed to be there. But you got a call and they were asking me, where's Joe, where's Joe, where's Joe? And the meeting started at maybe 7.15 and about 7.13 you rolled in and talked for an hour nonstop. And I cannot tell you the impression that that just makes on people is your ability to just get up and tell your story. And, and, and talk about your love and your passion and just radiate. So thank you for that. The second thing that I would tell you is one of our favorite nights when we traveled, we were at the uh, ACCT convention a year and a half ago in New York. And Steve and I had planned on going to a show a couple nights in, but you and Stacy were able to get tickets to Kinky Boots. So we went to Kinky Boots with you. <laughs> that will always be one of my favorite memories. So it was a great night. Thank you for everything. You were so supportive. Called you the day after the election and told you you were the first call that I made. And I said, I'm looking forward to this. So thank you for all your support and all you've done in our community. Thank you, Nancy. Absolutely. Your hair's getting longer. Your head's getting bigger. I'm not sure what it is. Looking good. <laughs> So when the chairman came in tonight, he said, there's no Shakespeare tonight, is there? And I said, no, there'll be no Shakespeare. But I do have one word that I want to capture you with. And I didn't realize that Dr. Liker was gonna say what he said, or the speakers on the screen were going to say what they said. But I think this one word captures all of their comments. And the one word comes from Christian Nestel Bovey, he was an American author and editor. He lived from 1820 to 1904. And here's the word he used that I think captures you, Joe, because you've always been about doing things for the benefit of this college. You've always had students top of mind. You've always focused on what does the data show about our effectiveness. You challenged us tonight with five great points that this word I think encapsulates you. Uh, we've had lots of faculty accomplishment that behind the scenes you have been very uh, promotional for. Your outreach to the community on behalf of the college has been superb, not to mention uh, a few building changes on campus over the 27 or 28 years you've been here. And it's rare that somebody these days can say they spent uh, 28 years over half of the lifetime of an, of an institution or an or organization. So thank you for that and thank you for your commitment. The word that I want to use tonight is earnestness. Earnestness, which by definition is serious in attention or purposeful. And here's what Bovey said about earnestness. Earnestness is the devotion of all the faculties it is the cause of patience, gives endurance, overcomes pain, strengthens weakness, braves dangers, sustains hope, makes light of difficulties, and lessens the sense of weariness in overcoming them. And I, I thought when I saw that word that in that definition by Bovey, it kind of captures many of the daily experiences you've had on this campus over 28 years, as Mary Birch said, from the foundation to, to uh, uh, Dr. Zamorowski recently with his travels with you on our international travel. So thank you, this isn't enough. I uh, appreciate um, your earnestness and how you have led this, this college for the benefit of teaching and learning 
and the benefit of student outcomes. So thank you, Joe. We wish you the very, very best, and we'll be seeing you often. Trustee Lawson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. President, when I first came onto this board, you and I had a frank conversation in your office, and I appreciated your candor regarding the pressures that you faced and the way in which you felt forced to respond at all hours with your time to those who had tons of white privilege. Uh, but that privilege took them away from your time you spent and wanted to spend helping others. And I saw a lot of that happen over and over again. I can hear in your voice tonight, and I'm sorry that we did not protect you better. You and I may not be friends. Uh, we may not like each other, but I know you have a good heart. Trustee Smith Everett. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, I'm not done. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Take your time. I know we don't have to pretend to be friends, but this speech tonight was the first time in a long time I saw the Joe I met that first weekend. I miss that Joe. And I'm sorry I didn't get to spend more time with the man I think you are instead of the role I feel you may have been forced to fulfill. That's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Trustee Smith Everett. Anyone who dedicates 27 years to one place deserves our utmost respect. I think I've aged 20 years in the six months I've been here. So I can't imagine uh, what 27 years does to someone. Um, Obviously, we have had the least amount of time together, but I wanted to speak to your graciousness. Um, and I think that that really speaks to what one has to do in this role. You have to be all things to all people. And um, you have, were incredibly gracious, particularly at the ACCT uh, conference, legislative conference, and um, introduced me to both national partners as well as our local Kansas partners. And I uh, really appreciate it. And I think it speaks to the way that you conducted yourself personally with so many faculty and staff and students. And they felt like they were the center of your attention, knowing full well you had 100,000 other things and priorities that um, were just as equally important. Thank you so much for all you've done and all you've poured in and all the sacrifices you've made over these tw almost 28 years to this institution. People have reaped innumerable benefits from it. And above all things, I wish you a relaxing uh, second half to your year and a very relaxing retirement. Congratulations. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'm gonna make some comments and then we'll let you close and then we'll move to a motion to adjourn. Um, we, we met about the time you started at the college and I started on the Overland Park City Council when I was on the Some Enchanted Evening Scholarship or Steering Committee, trying to raise scholarship money, nothing like the million dollars that John mentioned for last year. Uh, but in those 28 years, nearly 28 years, I've seen your dedication to this college, your love for the community, your sincerity in making education better, more accessible, more impactful and more affordable. And I've watched you take slings and arrows for yourself and others. Some deserve, but most uh, let fly for no reason or misguided. Um, it is amazing to watch as social media has expanded, how we, and the regular media has essentially disappeared, how we can underestimate and underreport the successes of an institution. And instead of marveling at what has been built here, we can focus on every imperfection, perceived or real. And as I thought about comments tonight, Joe, and I know you're sick of all these already, because I know how, how modest and humble you are, uh, equal to your beginnings in independence. But I thought of Teddy Roosevelt's 
uh, man in the arena. I revised it a little bit in the interest of modern uh, speech, but it is not the critic who counts, not the person who points out how the strong stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the person who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error or shortcoming, but who does not actually strive to do the deeds, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, great devotions, and spends themselves in a worthy cause. Who, spend, who at the best knows in the end that the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst, if they fail, at least fail while daring greatly so that their place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor, de nor defeat. I think in watching you for 27 years and for seven years as president, that pretty well sums it up. I thought also about the ESPN series, The Last Dance about Michael Jordan, arguably the greatest basketball player of all time, undoubtedly, undeniably, one of the top three or five at all times. And anybody who watched any part of those series, he was criticized. He didn't do it right. His attitude wasn't right. He made mistakes. And it's just amazing to me that as great as anybody can be, you can be frequently criticized even if you are rarely outperformed. Um, Lee mentioned the demands of your job, and, and I, I've seen that more in my two terms as chair. People demand you 24-7, 365. You're never unavailable. Um, people demand purity and perfection, demanded by many, practiced by few. They demand effort and excellence. Many demand, few perform. You demanded that from others, just like you demanded it of yourself. When you're demanding it of others, you get their chagrin. When you demand it of yourself, uh, you often get pain. And I've seen you in that. I thought about what the college means to you. It means 500,000 stakeholders, several hundred thousand students since you've been here, thousands of employees, hundreds of faculty, dozens of trustees, all pulling and tugging you in one direction or the other not always in the same direction. And so we come to what's your legacy as a teacher, because you've taught here, an administrator, a promoter, a funder, a consistent advocate for students, particularly those facing challenges, um, someone who talked the talk and walked the walk of diversity with the first African-American cabinet member, served with the first Hispanic or person of color on the board, the first openly LGBT board member, I remember you defending dreamers when it wasn't popular to defend them. I remember you opening the doors for Hispanic leaders at BizFest when I was able to speak to that group. And you talked about how most of these kids had never been on any college campus and never would be, but for BizFest being hosted at Johnson County Community College, Hispanic high school students doing a week long project. Uh, you're a careful manager of money. We sometimes overlook that in leaders but you always knew that it wasn't your money or the college's money. It's the taxpayer's money. It's the student's money. It's not our money. And you were careful with that. And one of my tests of character is how you handle other people's money. You passed. You never asked for a raise beyond what we gave everybody else on campus. Never in seven years did you ask for a raise beyond what we gave everybody else. Even though Every equitable measure that we looked at every year showed you deserved more money. I'm not saying you were underpaid. I'm saying you were more than fair to this college. And when people looked at your salary and said, how does somebody make that much money? I say, look at the other 18 members of the League of Innovation or our peer colleges. One year, this board forced a raise on Joe higher than the rest of the campus. And he and Stacy gave every bit of the extra money to the foundation for scholarships. That's character. Um, the more anybody knows about you and Stacy and the sacrifice and commitment you made to this college, the more grateful they are. Um, I love this quote from Will Rogers. He's not quite Shakespeare or whoever you mentioned there that I don't know of. Will Rogers said, we can't all be heroes. Some of us have to sit on the curb and clap as they go by. 
And I'm really proud tonight to be here to clap for you. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Greg. Um, well, I'd like to thank the board for this really marvelous tribute. Um, it, 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 it's a very special evening. Even though it's pushing 10 o'clock, it's still a, a, a wonderful evening, and, and thank you. I, um, if you may have not, I'm extraordinarily awkward in these types of situations. I do not like to be the center or in the spotlight. I really don't. And one of the things about this job is that you have to be in the spotlight, and it sure helps if you enjoy it. And in this community, and, and you saw some incredible um, representatives of that on that screen tonight, um, they, um, their commitment to the college and, and how they've demonstrated that, uh, it makes you uh, wanna live up to their expectations. And you have to put yourself out there. Um, I think Dr. Brown's really going to enjoy this community because it's a very giving and welcoming uh, community. Um, the college is so highly revered. I, I remember when we first moved here um, 28 years ago, and uh, we moved down here from Chicago with a three-year-old and a four-day-old baby and, and set up a shop. In fact, we lived in an apartment on 119th Street um, over there by 69 Highway because we were in transition. Um, it, it, I, I was kind of struck by how how welcoming and generous people were in moving here. I was also kind of uh, disheartened when I saw my picture and salary on the front page of the Sun, Oakland Park Sun. I'd never had that before. Um, every family member and, and my neighbors knew exactly what I was making, uh, which was kind of extraordinary. Um, but that's this community. And we raised our family here. Um, and and it's, it's a great place to be. It, it really is. And we're very appreciative of that. Um, you need to live in other parts of the country to, to really understand um, what I meant by that. Um, I could tell stories of poor Terry here. Um, I love to reminisce, um, and Terry's had to listen to all kinds of stories uh, these past couple days, and she's handled it quite well. Um, but when you've been here for 28 years, I can tell you that this place generates a lot of material uh, for good stories. Um, even tonight, you saw Dr. Zamorowski up there. Um, you know, we praised the simulation lab. That wasn't always what you saw. Our simulation effort was a mannequin behind a curtain in the corner of a classroom. Seriously. Dr. Zamorowski said he put 750000 toward it. John Stewart, as a board member, um, made the motion to let's match it. And that's how that simulation came to be. Um, Kathy Carver um, didn't have a supervisor. Dr. Carl, Dr. Zamorowski thought it needed a supervisor, um, and Kathy Carver's position was partially endowed, and the board stepped up and matched that as well. And now what you have is one of the top simulation programs in the, in the country, thanks to the courage of one board member and the generosity of a member of our community. Um, when uh, Dr. Zamorowski talked about going to Uganda, yeah, we roomed together um, for about five days, and it was fascinating. Um, we got to share a lot of stories um, and also talk about the value of that type of opportunity for a student to be able to go and work at the very same hospital in Uganda where the Ebola virus had started years before. It's kind of fascinating. Um, but those are the types of opportunities you get at a place like this. You know, and people would say, hey, would you ever like to want to work at a university? The beauty of the community college is that it provides access and opportunity to those who otherwise may not have that access and opportunity. And that's kind of like a cause. And it's great to be a part of something that is a movement because the community college movement is very, very real. And in today's society, it is indispensable to our future. And that is what I've always loved. I would never want to work, quite frankly, I have no interest at all working at a high-end university um, where everyone um, comes from relatively privileged backgrounds. I attended one of those. Um, great experience. I loved every minute of it. But I don't know if I'd want to ever dedicate my life's effort to something like that. So I would like to thank um, certainly the board for, for this evening. 
Um, I'd also like to thank those around this table who comprise the infamous cabinet or the leadership team. Um, the amount of respect that I have for each and every one of you um, is, is tangible. Somebody once said, what's going to be your legacy? And my legacy is going to be the people that I would leave behind in those leadership roles. And I believe that. And each one of you have carried an insurmountable load these past couple months. And you always have. I made a list and I call it things that happened under my watch for my own benefit. Um, and also uh, it could be beneficial down the road. I was kind of astounded how many things, most of which you don't even have a clue about, but that we did here. But the fact is I didn't do any of them. I get to take credit for the work of everybody on this campus and especially those around this table. So I thank you for that from the bottom of my heart. It's been so much fun working with you. Um, and I enjoyed your leadership and I wish you all the best of luck. So Trustee, Trustee Musil, um, again, thanks for a great evening. I appreciate you pulling this off. Um, and I'm, one last thing, um, you, know, you mentioned not being here for 28 years. Uh, the fact is, the fact is, um, most people don't ever leave this place. They really don't. Um, it's a great place to work for a lot of different reasons. And you're a part of a mission and everybody works together to try to accomplish that. Um, so it's really been a joy and it's been an honor. So thank you. This is so very anticlimactic and, and, and feels so inadequate for, for what you've done. We, we really wanted to embarrass you in a big public event, and we, we will still um, hold open the possibility of doing that. Um, I, I do want to thank all the staff around the table, the cabinet members, Dr. Lyker for being here, and especially our AV and IS staff for pulling this off. We're, we're going to do a, I'm sure you will be doing a, a, a debriefing on this and, and Probably, I suspect, calling me and saying, can we do this in the boardroom next month with some, some folks on Zoom and some folks in the boardroom. Our boardroom is simply not big enough to allow seven people to social distance. So we would have to, uh, to split up the board in some, in some manner or fashion. But um, there is nothing else. Home. Trustee Cross? I said I volunteer to stay home. Trustee Cross will stay home. Um, I'm sure that'd be a unanimous vote. Um, <laughs> <laughs> God, I'm kidding. Uh, we are ready for a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Trustee Snyder, seconded by Trustee Ingram to adjourn. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Yes. Anybody opposed say nay. Motion carries. We are adjourned.